Good evening, everyone. I would like to convene this regular meeting of the City Council. Please join with me and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, first item on the agenda is the agenda. Councilor Busher. Um, yes, uh, President Wright, I'd like to move to amend and adopt the agenda as follows. Note added written materials for Shelburne Street roundabout agenda item per Olivia DeRees. Amend the action for consent agenda item 6.18, communication Emily Wallace regarding renewable energy. Waive the reading, accept the communication, place it on file, and send a copy to BED General Manager Darren Springer per Councillor Busher. Note corrected version for consent agenda item 6.33, communication Lori Lemieux. Uh, board Clerk, Board of Electric Commission regarding Electric Commission attendance record per Councillor Busher. Note agenda item 7.03, report Church Street Marketplace District Commission as of 10-25-19 per Ron Redman. Note written materials for agenda item 7.04, communication update from Brookfield on City Place project verbal per C COS Rydell. And I so move. Agenda amendments are moved by Councillor Busher, and seconded by Councillor Roof. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the agenda as amended, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have our agenda. Item number two is a site visit to the Shelburne Street Roundabout. We need to be loaded onto the buses at about 10 minutes from now, so turn it over first to City Attorney Blackwood. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what you're doing tonight and tell the public what the Council is doing tonight. This is a hearing related to the development of the Shelburne Street Rotary Redesign Project. It has two purposes, what you're doing tonight. The first is to determine necessity, and the, sec the second part is to determine compensation. So the first, to determine necessity. The purpose of a necessity hearing is for the City Council to hear interested parties on the issue of whether the public good, necessity, and convenience of the inhabitants of the city require the taking of certain property interests needed for the Champlain Parkway Highway Project. If the City Council determines that the project is supported by reasonable necessity, it will approve a written decision that will have the effect of condemning certain interests in property, mostly temporary and permanent easements, that the State of Vermont has not yet secured through negotiation. Under Vermont law, necessity means, quote, a reasonable need which considers the greatest public good and the least inconvenience and expense to the condemning party and to the property owner. And that's from Title 19 of the Vermont Statutes, <laughs> Section 501. Necessity is not measured solely by expense to the city and includes both a reasonable need for the project in general as well as the individual property interests that make up the project. The term does not mean an imperative, indispensable, or absolute necessity, but only that taking be reasonably necessary to the accomplishment of the end in view under the particular circumstances. So that's the first thing that you're going to be uh, asked to determine as the City Council, and I wanted to make sure you had that in mind as you go looking at the uh, site. The second purpose is to determine the compensation or damages to which affected property owners are entitled if you determine that the project is supported by necessity. The City anticipates you'll hear evidence that it needs to acquire minor easements from only one property, which you, which you will have reviewed at the site visit. The law defines damages as the value for the most reasonable use of the property or right in the property and of the business on the property and the direct and proximate de decrease in the value of the remaining property or right in the property and the business on the property. The added value, if any, to the remaining property or right in the property, which accrues directly to the owner of the property as a result of the taking or use, as a distinguished from the general public benefit, shall be considered in the determination of damages. And we can go over this again when you are making a decision. The value of the most reasonable use of the property is the market value of the land's highest and best use as of the date of the condemnation. So those, I, I recognize that I read it very quickly to you, but hopefully you keep that in mind as you are going through the site visit tonight. And then um, the, um, Mr. President, you'll open the hearing when you come back from the site. And that's when we'll get a presentation from Mr. Rose? Correct. Thank you. 
Anything counselors need to know right now? This is not a final action on this. Correct. The, 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 the thinking is that you'll have a presentation tonight. You'll hear from the property owners. Um, you'll essentially hear all the evidence, have it come in, and that you will then do a motion directing the staff to create findings of fact in accordance with what, what has been heard tonight, what has been seen, and any comments that you give them. All right. Thank you. Uh, I think then we should be ready to recess this meeting and head onto the buses. And it would be great if we can be back here at maybe around quarter to seven. Um, we have a lot to do tonight and uh, a huge presentation later on. So uh, with that, I'm going to move to recess this regular city council meeting um, and we will reconvene it as soon as we can. Okay, so for the impacts to the, um, the majestic property here, um, we are um, going to um, obtain a temporary right to um, resurface, repaint the parking lot. Um, at the point at which we originally designed it, uh, the parking layout was a little bit different, but it's going to be identical to what you see here today, and, and that was at, a at the request of the owners because they wanted that angle to park. Um, we're going to be maintaining this driveway. It's going to look a little bit different, um, and um, there will be no rights necessary for that because it's all inside the uh, And the, the only permanent easements that we have are down at the corner by Ledge Road. So if you want to walk it, I'll put you guys to that. So the permanent easement is about, where the, truck, is about where the uh, pickup truck is, and it's the the permanent easement is um, to install and maintain a water line that the city has redesigned and required. Um, it's also for a drop inlet, like a catch basin, and an associated pipe that would outlet that structure. And that, and that would be what the permanent uh, easements are for. Where's the boundary of the city right away on this portion we're standing on right here? Um, it is, I would say it's probably in line with this crack give or take the curb is yeah, um, probably behind the sidewalk yeah. and then following this following that crack approximately to about that uh, catch basin there yeah so the easement that's shown on the plan in front of you is the permanent one is shaded in blue that will be grass it will be a grass strip that will still maintain that will still be under the ownership of the property it's just uh, a, a, a permanent easement so that if the city ever needed to come in and repair that water line or drop in lit catch basin or pipe they can come and do that um, they have the they'll have the rights to do that but it's going to be a grass area and it, and they'll they'll still be responsible for mowing it and maintaining it you know so will they lose a parking space out of this there will be no loss of parking okay. in this plan okay yeah okay all right um Mike, I had a clarification question. Um, you only mentioned the permanent easement for the water line. Is there also a permanant easement for the... Can you the try to ice? speak loud so everybody can yeah. hear? And Channel 17 is filming, so I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> so um, he mentioned the install and maintain permanent easement for the um, water line. I believe there's also an install and maintain permanent easement for the sidewalk itself. Is that correct? There, There is. Uh, yes, that is true. There is, in that same blue area on the map, there is a small triangle which the uh, the bike path, uh, the shared use path that's paved will will traverse as well. Can I ask another question? Sure. Okay. In in your um, documentation of what is temporary, what is permanent, and then the valuation that is assigned to that, um, my question is, if indeed the the majestic can't access some of their parking or their business during construction, is their compensation acknowledged in the money, 
Is there a dollar amount acknowledged for loss of access to the business? I'm actually going to. I'm actually going to defer that uh, question to uh, Rosa, who's our, it? what's that? Yeah. Can you repeat it first and question. then have Rosa? Yeah, so Rosa, if you don't mind coming in, Rosa is our appraiser. Okay. And so my question is, because yes. of the permanent easement and the construction that's going on right on top of this parcel, mm -hmm. basically, right. Or right around this parcel, in your compensation package, mm -hmm. did you put in a dollar amount that would talk about a limited access to the site or limited activity for the business during that construction time? Uh, yes. Uh, we and what, what was that defined <coughs> as? I think it's uh, $2,400 was the cost to cure so the property owner could park vehicles at another location. Uh, during the four to six weeks, actually we calculated eight weeks. And uh, Gosha, who did the appraisal, um, uh, researched rental rates in Burlington and estimated it at $100 per vehicle. And since they have 12 parking spots, those 12 were multiplied by two months, $100 each for $2,400. So one last piece of that. What sure. about the fact that customers might have difficulty accessing this spot to begin with? How does, how does that factor into the compensation? Well, I believe that during construction, everybody has access to the property. Yep. Um, I'll, I'll I, I understand that, yep. but it's going to right. be altered and might deter people from coming here. I, I, I don't know how you, how you project that or how you deal with that. Factor. Yeah, and, and that's something that our contractor will work with the individual property owners during construction to try their best to minimize impacts both physically and you know to their to their businesses and their homes have they had an issue with that have they questioned that yeah. um, no, not that i'm not that i recall uh, we only met them with the, the one time which was several years ago the answer to that question is absolutely right is yes we have questioned that i am Paul right. Lake. speak up Bob. yeah so we have questioned it um a two-year long project is going to put me out of business we all know time is money and as if you need to rent a car in a 24-hour period, you're not going to want to sit in traffic to come and get your car. You're going to go elsewhere to get that car because you don't have the time to sit in traffic to come in and get out of here. Um, it has been brought up, and it was brought up at a meeting with the uh, Department of Public Works. It was brought up at that meeting, it was a joint meeting with uh, VTrans, and it was told that that was my problem, not theirs. So at the end of the day, we're going to have this conversation, I think, back at your council meeting. But at the end of the day, my biggest concern is I have a, an operation here that is that provides a service to the community. And for two years, it's going to get disrupted. And we got to figure that out. It's not the $8,000 that I'm concerned about for a grass strip, which I do believe I'm going to be losing a parking spot, but also what are we going to do about the loss of the, the business? And thank you for asking those questions, by the way. Any other response? Nope. Nope. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, just in regards to the access, I'm sure it's discussed. But as someone who moves down there and goes to work up there and likes to walk back and forth daily, this is a nightmare. I'm scared to death to cross it. So how is the traffic flow going to balance pedestrian flow and, of course, bicycle flow? Because we all know that's the trend for the future. And Sheldon Road is another nightmare. I get you. Yeah, we can hear it. So this is probably the best place to have a dialogue, right? Is that yeah. what you're thinking? That we just yeah. are here to see the yeah. fiscal yeah. aspects? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, just It just looks like the parking is a little extended maybe right now. So this, if this truck is a space, it's in the probably the right of way, I think. It's, it's uh, losing a space, it looks like. It's because it's supposed to be a sidewalk there, I think, but that's just what it looks like from here. If you follow that line, it goes right up the middle of the truck. 
Okay, we're going to reconvene the city council meeting at 7:42, um, and we are going to councilors, please take your seats, and we are going to now I'm going to juggle this our agenda around a little tiny bit here. We're going to do item 7.04 now, which is a um, excuse me 7.05, which is the Shelburne Street roundabout necessity here. And I would like to invite city staff up to give us a brief presentation on this. And please identify yourself for the record. Uh, my name is Olivia Dries. I'm a public works engineer and I'm responsible for assisting the Vermont Agency of Transportation efforts to develop the Shelburne Street Rotary Redesign Project. Um, this has included a substantial amount of effort in coordinating the condemnation process. Our team has prepared written comments and my full testimony has been presented to the council. There are binders located over there on that table uh, for anybody who would like to look at the exhibits and the exi exhibits have also been posted on board docs. Um, these have been provided to the council and I'd like to introduce those into the record. The city supports VTrans' V-Trans's efforts to develop this project, which will not only enhance safety for all users at this location, but also establish a gateway into the city's south end neighborhoods and the Burlington's growing south end arts district. The project is consistent with the city's transportation plans, vision, and guidelines. VTrans has secured all but one of the property interests needed to proceed with the project development. These property owners have been fully compensated. We continue seeking interest from RJL South Willard Management LLC, shown as parcel 16 on the project plans and represented in exhibit one. A description of the outstanding property interests for this parcel are being introduced into the record as exhibit two. Notice of the site examination and necessity hearing were sent via certified mail to persons interested in the outstanding affected property, RJL Willard Management LLC, and the mortgage holder, North Country Federal Credit Union, more than 30 days prior to this hearing. Those parties were formally served at least 12 days in advance of the hearing. Notice was sent to the City of Burlington Planning Commission and posted in the City of Burlington Clerk's Office. The notice was published, published in the Burlington Free Press on October 14, 2019. Copies of the notice, proof of mailings, proof of sheriff service, and proof of publication are introduced into the record by the City as Exhibits 3, 4, 5, and 6. This concludes my testimony. I would like to introduce VTrans project manager, Michael LaCroix, who will be sharing his background, his role on the project, and a project summary. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, once again, I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, I just want to reiterate, uh, like Olivia said, my written, my written comments to the council are also provided. Uh, two points of clarification from the site visit, I just want to uh, make clear, I did misspeak at the site visit regarding the blue piece on the Exhibit 2 that you had in front of you. Um, I did say that that was grass, that was incorrect. It, is, it will be paved, uh, it is not grassed. Um, there will be uh, no loss of parking spaces for the uh, particular property um, at issue. And I do want to reiterate that uh, all properties along this project will have access to the properties at all times during uh, construction. If the primary uh, access to any of the properties has to be closed for a short duration, an alternative access will be provided. Again, we don't anticipate that very, uh, very many impacts to those accesses. Um, this is the best engineered solution to the safety issues at the intersection. 
Modern roundabouts, especially single lane roundabouts, have a proven track record for addressing excessive vehicle collisions across the United States with almost 3,000 constructed and operated. At some roundabouts in Vermont, we have seen injurious crashes go to zero after a roundabout installation. There is no reason to expect less results at this location with this engineered solution. Thank you. All right, thank you. And we now are gonna open this up to the public. Comments by the public? City Attorney Blackwood, is that the... Excuse me, President Wright. Yes. I believe we have one more witness that you need to hear from about compensation. Okay. And value of the property. Point of order. Point of order, Councilor Mason, what's your point of order? Aren't we in the necessity hearing now and the compensation hearing is next? Councilor Mason, uh, the, the hearings can be combined as long as the city council okay. hears both issues in full. Okay. It gives uh, effective property and Thank you. a chance to respond. Thank you. So we'll proceed, and if you would please identify yourself. Uh, my name is Rosa Benor. You need to have the microphone right close to you, okay. very close to you. My name is Rosa Benor. I am the right-of-way appraisal chief for the Agency of Transportation. I accompanied Gosha Carr during the site inspection. She was the appraiser trainee for this parcel. Who, uh, prepared the appraisal, and I uh, supervised her during that uh, development for parcel 16. Uh, the appraisal process included the analysis of highest and best use of the subject property as if vacant and available for development. In particular, the project does not impact improvements, and when that is the case, we value the land uh, to its highest and best use. And that conclusion was to be commercial use, uh, we chose the sales comparison approach to develop the opinion of land value using commercial land sales. And uh, the opinion of land value was $34.54 per square foot. That price per square foot was used as a basis to value the two permanent rights. Uh, the two temporary rights were given nominal assignments of value because of the minimal impact of those rights. The appraiser determined that there would be no permanent parking loss. However, there was a given a cost to cure for potential temporary parking loss during the period of construction. And my written testimony and the approved appraisal report are for parcel 16 are also included in the exhibits. All right, thank you. And now, City Attorney, we're ready to hear from Members of the public who would like to speak on the necessity for condemnation here. Anyone want to speak on this? Come on up, sir. Please identify yourself and pull the microphone in close. Good evening, and thank you for your time. My name is Bob Lake, and I am the owner of 616 South Willard Street. I'm here tonight. I've got a multitude of issues with this project. Um, I have spent, I've been at 616 since uh, somewhere 2007, mid-2007, I purchased the property. Pull the microphone a little closer, having trouble hearing you. You've got to be right on it. Okay. How's this? That's better. All right. So I've been involved, or I've owned this property since 2007. I've sat in that parking lot or stood in that lobby and overlooked the quote unquote, most, one of the most dangerous intersections in the state. I, I question the engineering. I question the, the number of, of accidents that they claim have been there. I also find it hard to believe that they're gonna take a, this road that, that has three access points essentially into Chittenden County, which is South Willard, St. Paul, and I believe South Union. And they're going to choke it down into one lane before you can enter either of those streets. You're going to back traffic up. That's a huge issue. The, ne the, the next issue I have is going to be my own business. If this two-year project with absolutely no concern about my revenue, the people are not going to 
be able to access as smoothly as it's been portrayed, that we're going to be able to just come and go, come and go as they please. When I query the engineers about this, there's going to be backup. There's going to be backup coming in and leaving my property. I'm, I don't understand how they, this, the state as well as the city can say that there's going to be absolutely uh, no effect, that people are going to have access, and if we block one access, that there's going to be another. Then when you take into consideration they want me to park off-site, well, if you come to me to rent a car and then I got to put you in another car to take you to your car, it's a ridiculous. It's it's ridiculous to think that 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 is a business sustainable business model. I and I when I've I've asked, including at a DPW uh, joint meeting with the state, I was told that that is my problem, not not theirs. So you can see my frustration and why I'm not just quick to sign off on having uh, some of, uh, to giving up um, for right away on my property. So before you guys sign on to this thing, don't let them build it only to find the problems. We already know what the problems are gonna be with the road itself. Then think about the, the fact that it is going to put my business, put me out of business there. There's no, there's no question about it. They've, there's a proven track record. And timelines don't seem to matter. We go four months, 11 months, 12 months. It doesn't seem to matter. When, when these projects get going, there's always issues, something they didn't know about, either by trial, by fact, by tribulation. There's always things that come up. So would I, if I were you, if I were the city council before you sign on and give the nod to the state to go ahead and start this project and join them, I suggest maybe you borrow some of the, the barriers that they used out on North Avenue and, and, and block the street off. Show people what's actually going to happen. I don't think people are actually taken in, in, uh, into consideration um, what the clogging of that road is going to do. I mean, you're going to back it up all the way down um, down to Home Avenue. It, it, it's, it's simple. I mean, you just, one, one street light, one cross, when you guys crossed tonight from my, from uh, South Willard back to your bus, it backed traffic up as far as I could see down Shelburne Road. So think about what that's going to do when you, uh, when this project is down to one lane into that roundabout. So, Again, please consider my business, the fact that there's no way I've been told to quantify the compensation uh, for the loss of business, and also think about taking that road and, and narrow it down to one lane. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blake. Anyone else in the public that wants to speak on the necessity issue? Hearing none. Uh, we will close the necessity hearing and I will recognize Councillor Mason for a motion. President Wright, is there, <clears throat> excuse me, do we take questions from the council before we move into the next that's, motion? That's right, I think, yes. Council, City Attorney Blackwood, we should take questions first. You should, but you should also make sure that everyone um, makes any comments they want to make about compensation at this point as well. In the public or? In the public. The Anyone else want to speak on the compensation issue in the public? And also, does staff want to respond to anything that's been said? You should ask that, yes. Does staff want to make any comments to the remarks that were made? No. No? Okay. Nope. Councilor Shannon? My question about compensation um, relates to, to what we just heard and a little bit of what we heard when we were out on the site about how um, the business is being compensated for parking. And what we heard was the, uh, the going rate to rent parking offsite is $100 per car per month. And so the calculation was done that way. But in this case, this isn't just parking for your employees or something like that. This is actually parking the inventory itself. 
the thing that is the business at that site. And it does seem like there's a difference between compensating for some kinds of parking that you can just move off site, but when it's the business itself, that seems like it would dramatically affect the business and potentially um, potentially cause a loss of, of the business. It's hard for us who are not running the business to really say how you would compensate for that. And haven't there been other cases where um, the property is actually purchased by the state of Vermont um, outright and uh, and then they can sell it at the end of the process. I think that there's, you know, the first question is, do you need to take the property that you're talking about to do this project? And I don't doubt that you do, but I think that the effects on this business will be profound. And is there another way to look at compensation? And what is the authority of this body with regards to compensation. Uh, Council Shannon, I could speak to the authority of the body on compensation uh, briefly. And uh, since this is a federal aid highway project, compensation rules are set by the Federal Highway Administration. <clears throat> um, there's some flexibility for negotiation in that process, uh, but <clears throat> the value presented by the by retrans today is the value set by the state and therefore by federal highway. So there would be some risk at valuing it above what federal highway allows <coughs> that, uh, that VTrans wouldn't be able to cover any excess comp <coughs> excuse me, compensation uh, paid for the property. <coughs> um, if someone could, from VTrans could speak to how uh, compensation is, is determined uh, related to the issues that you brought up, we could probably find someone here to do that. Someone from VTrans able to speak to that? Should be a compensation person. Um, the, uh, and, and one more time, everybody, you got to have the microphone right close in. Um, in relationship to the uh, loss of parking for the two months, it was based on the vehicles, the 12 spaces that are, uh, holds the vehicles for the business being located to uh, a nearby property that would be easily uh, accessed during those, that two month period. Um, as far as business loss, business loss is based on uh, the loss to the property over and above the acquisition of the permanent rights. If the property lost value because of a change uh, in the use of that property after the project. And in this case, there isn't a loss of parking spaces. The ingress and egress is the same and uh, the business will still have the same value other than the price paid for those permanent rights. I don't know if I follow up with Yes, Councilor Shannon. Isn't, isn't there a change to the value of the business during the period of the construction um, when, when the business is renting cars and when you're taking away the ability to store cars on that property, um, how does one maintain the business in that in that environment um, the uh, business loss is not dependent on the actual project taking place because it's a general uh, problem for anybody who's on the project um, there there is a business loss form that can be filled out to request business loss it requires uh, five years of tax information and we submit it to an economist to um, determine if there is business loss so if i laura wheelock department of public works so i think what they what uh, rosa is leading to is that business loss really can't be truly effectively determined ahead of time but it is looked at after 
the project has already been underway and that losses could be yeah. valued? Or it is, is it looked at ahead of time? Ahead of time? Yeah. Okay. Because it analyzes the change that will take place to the property because of the project specifically. So can you speak more about the timing of that and how one applies for it and what the likelihood of getting it is? Did, would it be too late for that now? Sure. Um, I think at the time, usually when we do the appraisal, if the property owner believes there's going to be business loss, that's something they ask for at that time. Have businesses requested that at this point? Not that I know of. I'll say Councilor Shannon. Yes, thank you. Councilor Pine. Councilor thank you, Pine. Mr. President. Uh, Councilor Shannon got to some of my questions, and um, what I see here is really the, the greater good is being served by this project if we all believe that and accept that, and that in order to do that, the um, certain property owners make sacrifices, and the compensation is attempted to is an attempt to compensate for those sacrifices. It seems as though this property owner, this business owner, has made a case that the city is taking a project without providing, or taking on a project in the state, uh, without providing adequate compensation for those anticipated business losses. Has there been, have, have, have negotiations been attempted and have they been exhausted, or are we not having negotiations at this point? That's what I'm not clear on. That would be a question that Bruce, would you like to answer? Oh, I knew this was going to happen. Yeah, good evening. My name is Bruce Melvin. I'm the acquisition chief for right away in VTrans. Some of the questions are related to the temporary disruption of access or the construction activities that are going to create issues of getting people in and out of his business. The, the fact is, if he was not, an, if he, there were no rights being acquired, he wouldn't be even here tonight for the hearing. You have to be directly affected by the project to be at this hearing tonight. So this is why he is here and claiming maybe some business loss. But if you were to do your highway project without touching his property, putting in a new water line, a new sewer line, sidewalk staying within the existing right of way, there'd be no compensation at all. So. There is going to be disruptions there, and the and circuitity of travel is not a non-compensable item under multiple court cases, and temporary business loss isn't something that happens unless you have a direct taking from the property that's, which is causing the business loss. Now, if we were taking a parking spot, or if we were changing the configuration of the property so that a business can't operate in the same manner in the after, that's a business loss. But it's, it's, it has to be ta mostly taken into account when you have a direct taking. Now, if we're near a gas station and the tanks may be <coughs> sensitive and we may be doing some blasting there, so we may have to uh, pump out the gas tanks during a period of construction and then compensate the owner for the net loss of sales directly tied to the loss of the gas not being available. So this isn't the situation that's happening here. He's making a claim for a couple of different points. One of them it goes to your necessity, which is the project's gonna put him out of business due to this reconstruction. But if you were, like I said, again, if you were to go out there and do this project without even stepping a foot on his property, you'd have the same issue, but he wouldn't even be being offered any compensation. And negotiations when south because he could have asked for business loss form during negotiations but he was non-responsive to the negotiator when his attempts were made by emails telephone calls and stopping by the negotiator is here if you wish to speak with him we could have given him a business loss uh, form at that time uh, again yeah. only one person can do this pull the microphone in all the way everybody can have the mic these microphones are weak so you've got to be right on the microphone because we're not hearing you Okay, we have the, nego the negotiators in the room with us tonight, and through multiple attempts, the negotiator was not able to make a c get a response out of the property owner um, from the last, for the last six, seven months. During this time period, if he had made a claim to business loss, he still could have asked for a business loss form and one could have been provided. The time for compensation is on you right now 
because you're the ones going to be determining necessity and the compass, final compensation tonight or at, when you go into chambers later. So the business loss form is something that wouldn't be a, um, applicable right now because you're making that determination of compensation. I'm just going to interject to say we are not going to do now the compensation hearing until the next meeting. So we're only going to vote on the necessity hearing and necessity if counselors are ready to vote on that. I, I do have one Councilor more Councilor Pine, and I don't, wanna, I don't yep. want to, this is, again, it's just necessity. We have a lot going on tonight, so I do not want to get bogged down over and over on this. Sure. The um, last question, is the process closed at this point? Is that what you're saying, that the, the, co the process around what level of compensation this business owner receives, is that closed completely? Yes, because you're making, you'll be making a determination, otherwise you'll have to extend your hearing. And there's, again, there'd be no guarantee that business loss would be available based on what's the claim. Okay, City Attorney Blackwood. J just to clarify, I think what we're suggesting is that because there's so many co questions about compensation, that maybe you turn your focus tonight onto necessity and then make a motion to end, the, to finish your conversation on necessity tonight make a motion to close the necessity hearing, but to continue the, con the, the uh, compensation hearing for next time. So yes. it will need a formal motion to that effect when right. you get to that point after you've finished your questions about necessity. Okay. Everybody understands that? Yep. Councilor, you all set, Councilor Pine? Yep. Councilor Busher? So, um, President Wright, I, I think that some of the people, I'm not sure, will be here at the next time. And I have two quick questions I don't feel, I feel I really need to know. This gentleman just, um, President Wright, just responded to Councillor Pine <coughs> saying that he gave an example of, of inventory for if indeed a gas station, you had to empty their tanks and then um, you could calculate the loss of revenue from not being able to sell gas. I think Councillor Shannon made the comment that the cars were inventory, and so if you couldn't access the cars, then I would see that as being the same kind of calculation, and I'm surprised that wasn't really discussed. So that's one observation. I'm just listening to comments and making my own observations. The second thing was, and I didn't fully understand this, I would like the answer to this question, is that there was a discussion about there was a way for compensation, but you had to go back five years to look at um, tax returns, and, um, and then the business could get compensated. But then I heard you say that that window had closed, even for that process, is that window closed, sir? As far as the hearing tonight would be concerned, yes, because it would. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Buscher. With the business loss form, you have, it's a form given to the property owner and it asks them to provide five years of back income taxes. It also has asked the property owner the claim as to where the business loss is directed from and caused from. And at that point, it would be given to an economist. The economist would look at it, and, and they would calculate if there is any net loss. And that what you get compensated for at that time would be the net loss to the, to the property owner, if any was found. OK, thank you. Councilor Tracy. So one of the things within the necessity hearing is the notion of the temporary easement in the two-month period. And I'm wondering what that two-month period is based off of. And given what we've seen in other parts of the city uh, with regards to contaminated soils contributing to longer timelines, if that two-month period is uh, going to be adequate to take care, to get into the site, the area of the, the project that we're uh, discussing as part of the necessity hearing. I would have to, to speak to somebody that. back here because I'm not well sure where the two-month timeline came in. God almighty. Is there someone else that can speak to that? Yeah, real quick. Um, that was our initial estimate based on uh, projects of this size and uh, other locations um, for that type of work adjacent to that property. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, we're ready to vote on just moving forward on the necessity hearing. Uh, I'm gonna recognize Councilor Mason. Uh, just there's make a motion to close the necessity hearing, direct staff to prepare findings of fact, question, conclusions of law, and an order for Councilor 
city council consideration at our November 18th meeting and to postpone the compensation hearing until our next meeting, which is scheduled for next week. That's the motion. Can I also make one quick comment after yes. the motion? It would be beneficial to have a little better understanding of what the positions of the respective parties are as from where I'm sitting, I'm not entirely tracking where the dispute is. I think it's in part the amount of compensation, but I think it's also the period of time that for which compensation is being sought. So if there's a way to get the council writ some written submission that will focus us, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, Councilor Mason. Appreciate that. City Attorney Blackwood, I just want to make clear a vote, a yes vote here on this. What does that lock the council into? A yes vote is saying that you're finding necessity, but you're going to subject to having issuing findings of fact that are going to come back to you. So if councillors had problems with this, they still have an opportunity to vote no if they wanted to at a subsequent meeting. Yes, you probably shouldn't vote yes if you know that you're definitely in the end going to vote no. You probably should vote no now, but you certainly can okay. vote yes today and then read the findings of fact and say you don't agree with them. All right. Thank you. Councillor? Councilor Roof, did you want to be recognized? Need a second on the motion. Okay, so you're seconding it? Second by Councilor Roof. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. I'm also going to be in opposition. So there is two nays, Councilor Polino and Wright. That passes by a vote of 10 to 2. And we are delaying the next item, the compensation hearing, until the next meeting or the compensation issue. Okay, we will now go back to the regular order on the agenda. And the next item is, I'm on the wrong Singing. Singing by the Ethan Allen residents. Good evening. My name is Susan Herrick, and I am Director of Resident Engagement at the Ethan Allen Residence. And I've brought my friends tonight here to sing for you just a little bit, but let me say a few things before we do that. Uh, the Ethan Allen Residence is an assisted living facility in New North Burlington. And we provide memory care, and we also provide uh, care for age-related challenges. Memory care, memory loss, dementia, Alzheimer's. When I say those words, does it make your heart flutter a little bit? Well, what if I said, you can live well with dementia? That's my challenge tonight, to say this to you and to say that we as uh, a society, we're always talking about we need to be more present. Let's be in the moment. Be here now. Live in the moment. And in fact, that's what people with memory loss do. They live in the moment. They have the moment. That's it. So what is our charge as a community, as caregivers, as family, as friends? What is our charge? Well, it's to find the silver lining. And well, the silver lining has already been found, my friends. It's music. And if you uh, were to Google dementia plus music, you would discover that there's pages and pages of research and scientific data that show the part of the brain that remembers music is not affected by this disease. That part of the brain doesn't go. So the opportunity there is immense. The opportunity is immense, and at Ethan Allen Residence, we know this, and we are participating in music every single day, one, two, three times a day. We make sure, as a nonprofit, that we provide this because music causes a transformation. It's called being asymptomatic. Asymptomatic. So sadness turns to joy. When music making, when singing, when listening to meaningful music, sadness turns to joy, anxiety turns to enthusiasm, confusion turns to clarity, and disconnectedness.
That's a big one. It turns to connection. We experience that every single day. So, at Ethan Allen Residence, we celebrate the moment, and what we do is we do gardening, we do art making, we do movement with rhythm, we do music, and what that does is it brings our residents alive. And it says there is still so much life to be had. And so we are here as a microcosm of a global, local, and, well, a local and global, that's plenty. <laughs> okay, we, we, we are looking forward to hearing them sing. I know, I've so had let's... I've three more words to say. <laughs> Opportunity, responsibility, and imperative that we provide for people through the end of their lives. All the way to the end. Good care, seriously focused care on what works for their lives. And it's music. Here's the Silver Lining Choir. Great, let's hear the singing. Uh, I'm so glad that the 
Burlington High School girls varsity soccer team could be with us here tonight. We are so proud of all of you. And we want to... And uh, if I may, I'd like to read this resolution in their, in their honor. Absolutely. That whereas the Burlington High School var girls varsity soccer team was inspired by the U.S. women's national team to advocate for equal pay and closing the wage gap, and in particular, Megan Rapinoe's charge to do what you can, and whereas the student athletes took it upon themselves to connect outside the classroom with a credible community partner in Change the Story Vermont, a partnership initiative of the Vermont Women's Fund, Vermont Works for Women, and the Vermont Commission on Women to learn more about wage inequity. Councilor Shannon, I apologize. Do you want us to wait for just one sure. minute? Let's give people a chance to... We good, President Wright? Yes, we are. Thanks again, everyone. Councilor Shannon, sorry, back to you. Sure. Whereas according to the Change the Story data, women in Vermont make 84 cents for every dollar that men do, known as the wage gap. And whereas the wage gap for black, Latinx, and Native women is significantly greater. And whereas women who work full-time are disproportionately employed in low-wage jobs in every age group at every level of education. And whereas women are significantly more likely than men to live in poverty or economic insecurity, in large part because they have primary responsibility for the care of minor children. And whereas the team worked with their coach and their partners to create custom branded jerseys with the popular slogan, Equal Pay. And whereas the team raised the money from eight different community partners in less than a week to be able to fully fund jerseys for each member of the girls team and to subsidize 84% of the cost for each member of the boys soccer team to symbolize <laughs> the wage gap. Good going. Whereas the student athletes recognized an opportunity for community engagement and support and created a way for community members to purchase the custom equal pay jerseys. And whereas the profits from the sales of equal pay jerseys will support women's programs in Vermont and specifically toward helping diversify the Greater Burlington Girls Soccer League, alleviating transportation issues that keep some girls in the city from participating. And whereas the team has now sold more than 2,500 equal pay jerseys, that number is probably really old by now, uh, to, to people in more than 38 states. And whereas while celebrating a goal, four players received a yellow card penalty for removing their game jerseys to real, reveal their custom equal pay jerseys, which they were wearing underneath. And whereas after receiving the penalty, each member of the team, con team conducted themselves in a respectful and appropriate manner. And whereas the story of the student athletes movement for equal pay and their celebratory penalty has been told on Good Morning America, This American Life, CBS News, Today.com, HLN, The Athletic, Fox News, The, the Athletic, Fox News, Anderson Cooper, full circle, and all local media outlets, including but not limited to the Burlington Free Press, and many more since this resolution was written. And whereas this news coverage has allowed this team's story to be shared with millions of people across the world, and whereas the team has skillfully, patiently, and energetically, and intelligently represented themselves as well as their team coach, school, school district, community partners, and the city during this process while coming closer together as a team, managing school workloads and competing at the highest level of high school soccer in the state of, the, of Vermont. Now, therefore, be it resolved that this Burlington City Council hereby recognizes each member of the Burlington High School's Girls Varsity Soccer Team as a change maker 
influencer, and role model for our city and our youth. And be it further resolved that this Burlington City Council thanks each member of the Burlington High School's girls varsity soccer team for their leadership on an important community issue and for inspiring us all to do better and fight for equality. And President Wright, I want to acknowledge that we too have rules in this council chamber about excessive celebration, and I think it's time we all take a yellow card. Yellow cards for all of you. <laughs> um, I know every counselor would like to say something, but we are not going to be able to do that, so please don't start raising your hands. <laughs> we can't have 12 people speak. Um, just on behalf of the council, Councilor Shannon said it, but uh, we are all extremely proud of you. It's been an incredible story. As Councilor Shannon also mentioned, it's, the story went viral. It's been all over the news. It's been international news, and we could not be more proud of you. And yes, we are going to bring you up for a picture. We should let everybody know that along with this great story about equal pay, it's also an incredible soccer team. And <laughs> and they play the semifinals, right, Maggie? Semifinals, Lydia and everybody else. Uh, CVU on Wednesday at what time? Three, Three o'clock. So good luck to the team, beat CVU, and on to the championship against maybe Colchester. We don't know, but it may be Colchester. And I've heard there's some bad blood there, so. <laughs> <laughs> so um, can everybody come up front? And the, Mr. Mayor, did you want to say a quick remark? I was going to wish them luck it's against CVU too, President Wright, so thank you. All right, we're all on board with that. Let me just add. We're all on board with that. Beat CVU. You, you have against made CVU. us all proud. Thank you. <laughs> Nothing against CVU, but beat CVU. Okay, if everybody can come up here in the well, and we want to get a picture. And we're going to with stand us? Up, I assume. We're going to stand up. <laughs> yes, we're going to stand Both up. Stand oh, I stand on a chair. Are you can get up here on the table, Council. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, what do you think? I, I'd like to see a show of hands. How many um, of the girls' varsity soccer team has been coached by Councillor Mason? And, and let me also mention that we have, we have Coach Jeff Hayes here. Congratulations, Coach. Nice job, Coach. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Give us say a couple words. Uh, first of all, uh, Councilor Shannon, thank you so much for those great words. And, and the rest of the city council and... Uh, the mayor, we really appreciate this opportunity to come here, and this, gr this group is such an incredible group. It makes me so proud to be their coach, the way they handle themselves on and off the field. They're amazing. They're going to do great things, and um, thank you so much. Thank you, coach. All right. I want to hold up our yellow... All right, thanks guys. Thank you once again to the Burlington High School girls soccer team. Best of luck in the next game Wednesday at three o'clock. I have a feeling there's gonna be a lot of interest in that game.
Um, How long do we have these on rental? Evening? I am going to okay. recess. Okay, everybody's got to be a little quiet though, or I'm going to have to yellow card you again. <laughs> and it will count in your next game. Okay. Um, I'm going to recess the regular city council meeting at 7.32. We didn't vote on the resolution. Oh, good point. Good point. Uh, we have the, the resolution has been moved and seconded. It was seconded by? It was second. Councilor uh, Council Pine. Pine. All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. Aye. Any no's? Passes unanimously. Congratulations once again. Thank you all. Now, I'm going I heard, to... I heard Councillor Mason, Councillor Mason vote yes as well. He did. He absolutely did. And we are now going to recess the, the regular city council meeting for, at 7.33 to adjourn the, to adjourn, to <laughs> convene the Liquor Control Commission. And I'm going to turn it over to the chair, Commissioner Roof. Thank you, President Wright. Uh, I will move the agenda. I'll make a motion to adopt the agenda. Moved by, seconded by Councillor Hanson. Moved by Councillor Roof, Commissioner Roof. Seconded <coughs> by Commissioner Hanson. Commissioner Roof. Move 2.01, approval of a 2019-2020 first and third class restaurant bar liquor license application for Einstein Tap House at 165 Church Street with the following conditions. All city permits need to be closed out, contingent upon fire marshal approval with all standard conditions. Thank you, Commissioner Roof. Seconded by Councillor Hanson. Uh, we already had an, um, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Commissioner Roof. 2.02, .02, I will move the approval of a 2019-2020 second class store liquor license application for Riverside Tree, 500 Riverside Ave, with all standard conditions. Second by Commissioner Hanson. Discussion by the commission? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Commissioner Roof. Move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Seconded by Commissioner Jang. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned and back. We will now reconvene the regular city council meeting at 735 and open up the public forum. I have a few people signed up to speak, and if you do want to speak and you haven't signed up, there are slips over here on the table in the corner. If you want to speak on an issue, bring them over here to the clerk's office and they'll get them to me. So at 735, I will open up the public forum, and the pers first person scheduled to speak is Brad Pet Petnell. Petnell. Good evening, welcome. Pet and Gill. Pet and Gill. Oh, there we go. There is a G there. Okay. Just hand them to somebody and have them pass them around. Thank you. I'm Brad Pettengill. I've worked at One Main Street for 30 years. In that time, our beautiful waterfront has emerged from an industrial wasteland to become Burlington's destination for recreation, tourism, exercise, education, culture, and business. With the Echo Center, the Bike Path, and Waterfront Park, we truly have an, a unique, amazing gift. People come here from all over the world for our quality of life. With fresh air, mountain views, and a vibrant economy, we are a healthy place to live, work, and raise a family. We're a top vacation destination. We're leaders in sustainable energy. We care for and protect our environment, and our waterfront is a shining example of all this. So I'm extremely disappointed that the city of Burlington is considering a second rail line here of all places. Imagine the thousands of people who enjoy this area every day <coughs> confronted with diesel fumes, sewage disposal, noise, and crowding. Imagine walking down to the lake to see the sunset and two trains are blocking your view. Imagine this wide open uninterrupted space with direct lake access cut off. Imagine your restaurant or store closing because no one wants to deal with this mess and your foot traffic dies. People of all shapes, sizes, ages, and abilities enjoy this area freely, 
safely and without fear. The bike path comfortably accommodates cyclists, runners, people in wheelchairs, families with strollers, seniors, kids, and people walking their dogs all at the same time. Add a second rail line, all that goes away. International Fire Code says a fire department access lane has to be at least 20 feet wide, so how can this path be reduced to eight feet? How does a nine-foot-wide emergency vehicle fit down an eight-foot-wide corridor between a train and a building and still have room for firefighters and EMTs to do their job? Please, don't destroy 30 years of progress. Don't return this area to a stinking, smoking wasteland. Please protect this unique treasure for all the people who visit here, work here, and play here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pettengill. Melinda Moulton is up next to be followed by Richard Moulton. Good evening. Welcome. Here we are. Hi. Um, my name is Melinda Moulton, and I'm the CEO of Main Street Landing. I've spent the last 36 years of my career uh, with Lisa Steele redeveloping the Burlington waterfront. And I'm back, and I just wanted to share with you very quickly um, that when we built phase one, which included the cornerstone, the wing building, and the Union Station, we were required uh, by the, in our permit that was given to us by the zoning department to um, get an easement on the west side of our project. And the reason why they wanted an easement on the west side was for security reasons and safety issues and the ability to deal with emergency vehicles to access our property. We had to get that easement in order for us to get our permit to build the building. So our building would not have been built without getting that easement from the city, the state, and the railroad. Um, and it's a 20-foot easement. And now we have um, the potential to have that, bi that bike path, pedestrian walkway, reduced to eight feet. Um, on Friday, I have uh, some pictures up here. On Friday, uh, there was an accident on the bike path. Um, and I, somebody went down. I don't know if it, was, if it was a heart attack or what it was, what the reasoning was. But the emergency vehicle had to come down. And, and you can see in the photos, which I'm going to hand, hand you, that in order for those people to be cared for, it literally took the whole entire uh, bike path, pedestrian pathway, to get serviced and to be treated and to be taken out on a gurney. So my concern, I have very, very deep concerns. I have another picture here that I'm going to hand out to you, which shows where the bike path is now and when, what's going to happen when two trains are brought in. We're big supporters of Amtrak. I've spent 36 years of my career fighting to bring Amtrak back. We built the train station. Uh, we want to see the train there, but we do not believe that there needs to be a second track. Amtrak could pull in tomorrow. It could pull in tomorrow to Union Station. We do not need a second track. And I believe that that bike path should be, it should be maintained as a pedestrian walkway at the width that it is in order to, to create a safe environment and, and an ability for train travelers to be able to walk north and south from King to College Street. So if you've ever been down there, even when the dinner train is parked there for six hours, you can see what that's like. Uh, imagine another train parked there, and believe me, if there's a second track put up, brought back on the waterfront, we expand the rail yard, there won't just be any kind of train or dinner, the dinner train. There will be fuel trains, and there will be service trains, you know, emptying, emptying sewage. And it is going to change incredibly the character of this beautiful place that we've created. So I'm going to hand out these pictures, and um, we'll be back. Um, this isn't the last time you're going to see me. I apologize for that. But thank, you. thank you very much. Richard Moulton is up next to be followed by Sandy Wynn. Good evening. Good uh, evening. Thanks. Welcome. Thanks for letting me uh, speak. I have the good fortune, I have the honor uh, to uh, read to you a um, a letter from uh, Howard Dean, uh, I'm Governor Howard Dean, uh, to this um, August body. As, as you know, I spent a lot of energy in my public life fighting for public access to the waterfront and the creation of our magnificent Greenway. I have also spent much time helping to bring Amtrak to Burlington. Many of you have also worked hard on these things. Now we find that both efforts could collapse at the last moment because of a lack of adequate public input. 
unreasonable demands by the railroad, whose property is owned by the state of Vermont and leased to the railroad, as well as the requirement of this proposal to put a bike path along Battery Street for several blocks. This proposal is a disaster. The bike path belongs west of the current tracks, and yet there is no agreement to do this with the landowner who currently owns the needed property. The idea of a second track created by destroying much of the existing passenger platform is ludicrous, given the existence of alternatives, which include an entire rail yard to the south and a long spur to the north, which currently serves as a storage track for up to 75 tank cars. There are other alternatives in addition to this. Surely all of us, with the assistance of the state, which owns most of the land we're speaking about, can come to a reasonable compromise which will allow Amtrak to come to Burlington without delay and improves the bike path in its most congested area. We do not need a choice between destroying the bike path and bringing Amtrak to Burlington. The plan put forward recently is such a choice, and as a champion of both efforts, I will pick the bike path over Amtrak if we're forced in that position. We must have a guarantee of the relocation of the bike path to the west of the track and a plan which provides for a far more reasonable solution than constructing a new track where none is needed or wanted. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Moulton. Sandy Wynn is up next to be followed by Lee Terhune. Good evening, Ms. Wynn. Welcome. Oh, we get, we get treats. One apiece. <laughs> They'll pass it around. Thanks. So this, uh, this year, Americans will spend $9 billion on Halloween candy. Just for this holiday, this week, $9 billion. The number one candy you will buy is chocolate. Fair trade chocolate is not a huge part of that amount you're going to spend. But the people who pick the cocoa, who make our chocolate, that would be children, slave children, women who do not get fair pay, and men who do not get fair pay. This is a fair trade town, and I would love to see us all to commit. If you are going to buy chocolate, consider buying fair trade chocolate. We have a wonderful company right in town called Lake Champlain Chocolates. There are other companies as well. You don't have to buy chocolate, but if you do, if you're going to support equal pay, which we clearly do, please support fair pay for the people who make our chocolate. And there's not a lot in that basket because I shared it with the soccer team, so you don't get as much <laughs> this year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wynn. Lee Terhune, followed by Isabel Suarez. Good evening, Ms. Terhune. Welcome. Good evening. Um, I love that the theme tonight is equality and fair trade. I'm here to talk with you about the mural. I'm asking you to reconsider leaving it up as long as 2022. You can remove it by 2022, which means you could remove it tomorrow. Five years was what was advertised in the RFP, in the contract template, and is reported by donors. Five years. That was up two years ago. You're the elected leaders of our community, and you can signal our community values of inclusion and unity by declaring that all belong. Moving the parade mural into storage now, while decisions are made regarding its highest and best use. We know more about the parade mural now, its wall life, how it was sold to those who paid to be included, VARA rights as they pertain to the previous mural, and the parade artist's sensibilities when doing his commissioned work. 
Wall Life, the RFP, the contract template, the testimony of a major donor to the task force, all assigned a five-year life to the display of the mural. Vara, Vara protects the original muralist's work, not the commissioned ELAP commercial work, and, and replacing panels that have been removed constitutes a second Vara violation. The expectation was that the parade would be displayed for five years based on the RFP, the contract, and the testimony of donors. I repeat this over and over because this information was not given to the mural task force, and I don't believe it was given to you either. City government, school department, police department, they're all trying for diversity. Everyone is in our community is harmed by the parade mural because it institutionalizes white supremacy. The mural task force discussed the mural as a commercial billboard, illegal in Vermont, and noted that it includes an advertisement for tobacco, also illegal. Advice from the city attorney provided to the task force and city council did not address these issues. And at the time, the city was denying the billboard violations of the Synex boards around the pit, now removed after the state ruled that they were billboards. But please take to heart the most essential issues here that our community is harmed by promoting the notability of white people advertised and embedded in this reflection of our so-called history that excludes non-white people, rendering others invisible, ignoring notable contributions to our community by many different colors of people, and thereby institutionalizing white supremacy. The social construct and the racism it engenders makes a false claim that the privilege of superior white people is earned by merit, hard work, a higher capacity of intelligence, when in fact that privilege is the result of a racist construct Thank you, Mr. that subjugates Hume. people of color and unfairly Isabel Suarez is up next. From, from Thank you, Mr. Hume. Isabel Suarez is up next to be followed by well, Ali House. Equal pay. Good evening. Welcome. Hi. Okay. Do I? Is this okay? Yep. Um, hello, all. I'm Isabel Suarez, and I'm a junior at the University of Vermont. Um, I'm here today to hold you all accountable because I'm frankly disturbed and disgusted that the at the inability of those in charge of Burlington's public works to not keep this space inclusionary and safe for all people who come here. Who come here? The Everybody Loves a Parade mural is a monument and testament to colonizers, to white people stealing what is not theirs, and it, exempl and it is exemplified with the panel of Champlain discovering the lake and his meeting with a Huron or Algonquin native person, a group that does not even hail from Vermont. This is not the beginning of Vermont history. No, Vermont history started long, long before any colonizers came. No notable Native Americans are present in the 400 year timeline depicted by this work. Many wish to tout Burlington as a liberal bubble and a safe space, but don't want to put in the work to do that. After reading Pierre Hardy's response to people's complaints about the mural, I was even more outraged and disgusted that it wasn't immediately removed. It is a monument to racism. It is a monument to white supremacy and it's harmful colonialist rhetoric. In, ad in addition, I believe that Hardy's comments were completely inappropriate and racist in and of themselves, making me wonder further why the mural still stands. He claimed that without Everybody Loves a Parade, marginalized groups would not have a voice and things are evidently improving because of the mural. In his response, he cited Abraham Lincoln as one of the four instances of African Americans in ELIP. That makes no sense considering that Abraham Lincoln was a white man, but he said it anyway and was not penalized for it at all. The absurdity of that statement is mind boggling and he didn't even, he's not even from Vermont. <laughs> the idea that there are no notable people of color in Vermont history is disgusting, astounding, and cruel. There are many people of color that have enriched Vermont and made it the place it is today. In fact, many people on the mural are not Vermonters at all, so it mystifies me how still barely any people of color made it onto that mural. Hardy also mentioned that, he never had to deal with race as a key factor in his life, and he does not see skin color. My identity as a, brown, as a brown Puerto Rican girl with native heritage never leaves me, ever. It is something that has marked me and my family forever and will always mark us. 
leaving a tra- it has left a trail of intergenerational pain and trauma, and now I'm able to take pride in that identity. However, that history has been stolen from me and has continued to be stolen from people of color every single day. This land that we stand on is stolen land. I want to know my history, but there's so little access to it. And I'm tired of having to come and do the work for white folks in power and explaining that people have a right to their history and a right to know their past. In conclusion, I'm imploring city council to remove this mural that is a lousy excuse for public art Thank you very and a disgusting testament Thank you to very white much, supremacy Ms. in Suarez. Vermont. Thank you very much. Ali House is up next to be followed by Nick Florsch. Good evening. Welcome. Hi. How are you all? My name is Ali House, and I'm a junior social work major at the University of Vermont. And I would like our city council to know that this mural has no place in our town. In a place that's so rich with history, there is no room and no tolerance for images that portray a whitewash history and such overt racism as this. Look at your shirts. And look at the shirts of all the girls who are standing back there. That's what this town stands for. Justice. And what is right. Please know that this mural has caused hurt and you alone have the power to change it. We, as a University of Vermont social work students, will not stand for this. Stand up for what is right and be more than just politicians. Be people and see the harm that it's causing. Make space for history to be retold the right way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nick Florsch is up next to be followed by Steve Goodkind. Good evening, councilors, mayor, city hall staff. My name is Nick Florsch, captain of Code for BTV, local chapter of Code for America. I'm here to give you an admittedly belated report on the event the city council sponsored on September 21st with your discretionary fund. The event was our local celebration of the Code for America event, the National Day of Civic Hacking. The theme this year was to push forward local and national criminal record expungement efforts in concert with National Expungement Week. We really want to engage the public and learn more about how the expungement process in Vermont looks through the eyes of those who need it the most. We decided to start by using the event to engage with legal professionals that know about and deal with expungement. There were two key desired goals, to create a clear plan for how to discuss the expungement process with citizens at future expungement clinics, and to share the work we have already done to automate much of the expungement process for Vermont Legal Aid with other lawyers. A total of 16 people participated, which is not a large number, but the people that did attend were key individuals in this community, and it allowed uh, for the event to be a real success. This event that you funded was the first time that some of these key individuals had met or been in the same room. As a result, uh, some new relationships were formed that are allowing continued progress with pushing expungement forward in the state. Here's a list of outcomes we've identified, a clearer and broader picture of who is impacted by expungible criminal records, how and why, a clearer definition of the various stages that these individuals move through in the expungement process, sparking new collaboration opportunities with attorneys in the area, a much better idea of how to discuss expungement when we're at the clinics with citizens, the beginning of a conversation with the state judiciary, brigade engagement and visibility, as well as a CCTV video of that event that we're going to be using to share with the national organization, energizing our team, and perhaps most surprisingly, a direct path forward for expungement work in Vermont um, with the slowing down of VLA's expungement clinic effort. So on this last point, let me clarify that Vermont Legal Aid's grant that funded their push starting in July of 2018 to run multiple free expungement clinics has expired or is expiring. They will still be holding occasional clinics, but they will be fewer and farther between. Vermont Legal Aid's next clinic will be in New Year. One attendee to our event was State Attorney Dennis Wigman of Addison County. Mr. Wigman is working directly with our team to coordinate an expungement clinic on November 8th at the Addison County Courthouse using the software we built originally for Vermont Legal Aid. We expect the teaming up this way will demonstrate to other state attorneys that this software could be used throughout the state with minimal training and will allow a small number of legal professionals to process three times as many justice aggrieved citizens than if they did the work manually. Thanks again to the council, especially Councilor Roof and Beth Anderson for working with us through some confusing issues to help keep the event on track. It all came together very nicely. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Steve Goodkind is up next to be followed by Benjamin Glenn Peters. Good evening, Mr. Goodkind. Welcome. Thank you. Any more extra t-shirts, by the way? No. no we've got them all. In order. Hey. Anyway, I wanted to talk about... Are you kidding? These are loners. Oh. I'd like to talk about environmental justice as it relates to the Champlain Parkway. I, I sent you a letter. It's, it's in your packet. Maybe you've had time to read it. If not, I just want to try and make a or talk to a few high points of it, and I really would encourage you to read it. The Department of Justice, Federal Department of Justice, is requiring that the Champlain Parkway undertake an environmental justice review before the project can proceed. This review has an opportunity to be a game changer for the project. We have the opportunity now to see that this project actually is a project that we want, a project that I think most people support, and not the project that's been imposed upon us by the record of decision that the federal government made in 2009. I think it's fair to say, and some of you have voted this way in the past, when we brought this to the board back in the 2000s, that there's one thing that everyone agrees is wrong with this project. I think for myself, the mayor, everyone sitting at this table. That is, the project should not be directing its traffic through the Pine, Maple, King Street neighborhood. It's wrong. It was never what the city desired. For 40 years, the city had many different versions of the project. All of them took the, tra took the traffic around that neighborhood. In 2009, during the last environmental impact uh, process, the city fought actively against a route that the federal government was preferring, and that's the route we have now to take the traffic up Pine Street to Main Street. Some of you were on the council at the time. We made presentations. The council was unanimous in its support, I think. I'm not, Joan, I'm not sure you were supporting it, but you were at that point maybe not in favor of the project at all. But I think this part, even this, you agreed with. If it's going to happen, it should not take that route. We made an environmental <coughs> justice argument, but we're told at the time that the rules for environmental justice weren't very strong, and it couldn't trump the other environmental issues. It uh, forced that selection process to take place, as it did. Things have changed. In the time since the last EIS, the rules for environmental justice have been greatly strengthened. And now, the project must comply with them. Those rules basically state that the project should not, not, uh, what's the right word, disproportionately impact low income and minority neighborhoods. And if it does, that the project must show that there's no other, no other alternative. It couldn't be done another way. Well, I think everyone who's familiar with the project knows there were about three or four other ways. It certainly could happen. The city has never taken the position to this day that it really supports the route that's been proposed now. We've accepted it. I'm not sure we've ever actually said we like it or want it. And I think there's a real opportunity now, if this council takes some action, that you can pass a resolution. Well, okay, if I'm done, you have my letter. I just suggest you read it. It's, I think you can make a real difference now. We can have the project we want. Thank you, Mr. Goodkind. Thank you. Our final speaker tonight is Benjamin Glenn Peters. Is there somebody that has a name similar to that? Because <laughs> the writing's a little... Okay. Good evening. Welcome. You need to, you need to take a seat so we can, you can use the microphone in channel 17 and everybody else can hear you. Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Speak right into the microphone. All right. I'm not the best public speaker, and I don't really want to do this. But um, I do want people to, uh, to think about uh, their own kids and also uh, their parents and uh, basically themselves too, but everybody in the community because... Uh, especially children, and especially elderly people, and especially girls are being affected by this uh, problem that I want to talk about, and it won't take long. Um, however many years ago, probably eight or nine or something, uh, all of us have uh, gotten fancier phones and also we all have uh, wireless transmitters in our house 
And there are meters on everybody's house now that put out a lot of electricity. And because human beings have within their own body an electrical system, that's how you operate. That's how you can live. That's what the heart does. It moves blood through your body electrically. And when you take artificial energy and you move that throughout your environment all day long you get sick and all of the kids in our schools or I would assume probably but I see it in my cousin I have a younger cousin she's in college or she just graduated and she's tall she looks like uh, she looks like the guy in that Nightmare Before Christmas movie you know she's wicked tall and she's skinny and everything and now because of that, it's harder for people who are wiry or more sensitive or whatever, but it's hard for everybody. But because of that now, she can't stop moving her fingers. And she really has a hard time. She has a lot of anxiety socially and things. And this is not because of anything she did wrong. It's because she lives in a home where there's a wireless device that's filling up her environment with electricity all night and all day. And then she goes to school and there's lots of them in the school doing the same thing. I appreciate you listening and I think we can fix this problem because I think there's a solution to it, especially if we work together. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Yeah. And with that, that concludes our public forum for this evening. Thank you, everyone who spoke to, to us tonight. And we will now go back to the agenda to item number five, which is the consent agenda. Councillor Busher. Yes, I'd like to move to adopt the consent agenda and take the actions indicated. Moved by Councillor Busher, seconded by Councillor Roof. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of passing the consent agenda and taking the actions indicated, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. We will move now ahead to item gotta find my place here. Seven point oh one, an indoor entertainment permit application. Council Roof. I'll move approval of a 2019-2020 indoor entertainment permit application for Einstein Tap House at 165 Church Street with the following conditions. All city permits need to be closed out contingent upon fire marshal approval with all standard conditions. Moved by Councillor Roof, seconded by Councillor Tracy. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Item 7.02 is a presentation from Zoe Richards, Director of Burlington Wildways, and Alicia Daniel. Can we get the slide presentation up? I think I sent it along to the council. Do we know how to do that? Oh, she's working on it. Oh, great. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just in the interim, I just wanted to um, uh, thank the council for letting us have an opportunity to report on what we're doing um, at Burlington Wildways. And um, while we're getting the presentation up, I can um, uh, just say that Burlington Wildways is actually um, a partnership group that was formed right here in the council. Um, and um, uh, it, we started up and were formed by the council two years ago 
um, by our City Council resolution. Um, and the goal of the City Council resolution was two things. It was to recognize the amazing natural areas that we had in the City of Burlington. And it was also um, put together to uh, foster ways for us to continue to conserve those areas into the future, um, as well as allowing access for people to those natural areas. Um, and I thought we would just start, if we could move on to the next slide. Yep. I thought we would just start um, with just a little bit of a reminder of how incredibly fantastic it is out there um, in our natural areas in Burlington. And I'm going to turn that over to Alicia to yes, share thank, with us. Who's thank our you. Yeah, we, uh, we've had an amazing uh, meeting this evening. It's been quite interesting and it's clear that we have a lot going on socially in Burlington. Really very active community and I'm excited to be here and hear what's happening. We also have an incredibly rich natural heritage. We live in a beautiful city. So I'd like to, can I just point at you for the slides? Thank you. So uh, my, one of our most iconic wild places is Rock Point. Um, people fly from all over the world to see this thrust fault, just a very famous uh, geologic feature, but also just incredible habitat for plants and animals. These uh, lakeside uplands that we have, um, we also have promontories like Ethan Allen Park, um, rocky places where people enjoy views, but also animals and plants live in the city. Um, we also have wet places like the Burlington Intervale, and Zoe's gonna swing back to a good story about the Intervale in a few minutes, but it uh, just provides diversity and uh, ecological habitat for animals that don't live in the rocky places. Um, and then we have kind of a combination of both. We have a, a wet cave system, the Intervale Sea Caves it's called, um, where at plants and animals uh, come for all kinds of reasons. Um, and this is a black crowned night heron hanging out in front of that cave. So when you think about the city of Burlington from a wildlife uh, diverse and ecological diversity perspective, the green heart of the city really is the place that helps uh, cool our air and filter it and um, it provides uh, ways to slow the water down and make it fresher as it enters the lake. So the green heart of the city is key to Burlington, but the wild edges are too. The river um, that runs through town and the lake shore are places that, that animals hang out regularly. And I'm gonna get to that part. It's not the only place we see them. Um, when you combine uh, an urban environment with wild edges, you get crazy things that happen, like this moose that ran across the UVM campus um, a couple of years ago, and it's not the only one that's done that. Uh, we have kind of unique cultural things like our tallest filing cabinet that exists next to a wet area where you can see here and see tree frogs in the springtime. Uh, wildlife biologists tend to think of cities as either being bear cities, bobcat cities, or squirrel cities. You sort of have a choice in the way that they're designed and planned, um, how wild they can be. And for a moment in June of last year, um, well, this year, actually, we had a black bear on the UVM campus. So we became a bear city for a fleeting moment. Um, and it was kind of an exciting time. It had been about 20 years since we'd seen a bear in Burlington. And we know that because we've been gathering wildlife data and so our more common residents are things like red fox who exist in the Intervale and sort of farmers down there have relationships with some of these foxes that have been there through generations. Um, but they're spread, as you can see from the data, from the points on the map, they're spread pretty thoroughly throughout the wild areas of the city. We also have gray foxes. I'll just flip through these quickly. You can just keep going. Uh, we have bobcat that we find along the river. We have fishers uh, that roam through our woods. Um, we have, as we continue, moose, as you know, that visit occasionally coyotes. There's a, they've been heard howling down at Rock Point. Um, we have mink and beaver and otter that all love our wildlands. Um, so in addition to the wildlife, there are also beautiful and unusual plants. These flowers all flowered this spring in uh, Arms Forest, which is behind the high school and connects to Rock Point. So we have things like gay wings and uh, lady slippers, and also wild birds that migrate through and sometimes live in the area, particularly in the floodplains of Burlington. And taken together, uh, all of our just 
unique and unusual wildlands create habitat for um, plants and animals that really exceed the expectations in Vermont. We are really one of the most wild and diverse places um, in the state. And I'll turn it back to Zoe to tell us more about what we're trying to do with that. Yeah, so um, I think this next slide illustrates why we have formed the partnership organization called Burlington Wildways. So on the left, you see the open space that we have. On the right is the political reality of that open space. So the left is the open space, the right is the open space by ownership. Um, and we're in a sort of jumble of ownership. Um, and in order to make sure that we still have this open space and functional natural areas in the future, we really felt like a lot of the major landowners needed to start to work together to provide access. It's one of the reasons that it's hard to find your way around the arms forest behind the high school because it's under multiple ownerships with no one jurisdiction. It's hard to have signage and wayfinding. So as a group, we're really working to push that agenda forward. If I could have the next slide. Yes, yeah, so um, the city council resolution two years ago recognized that. Um, it recognized the value of what we had. It, it outlined some of the problems that we have with conserving those natural areas and allowing for access to those. Um, and what the resolution did was it asked two things. One was for the conservation board, the Winooski Valley Park District, and the Parks and Rec Department to sort of get together and figure out how to solve some of this. Um, and then it asked for a second thing, which was to put together a summit. Um, and that summit meeting would um, gather lots of experts and try to figure out how do we have ecologically sensitive access to our natural areas and how do we conserve them into the future. Um, so if we could have the next slide. So we're, we're really just here to report what we've done since then, um, since two years ago. Um, so we had that summit meeting out at Rock Point. We invited, um, we hope to have a meeting of about 30 experts. Um, and we invited 50 people hoping we'd get 30 and we ended up with 70. So we knew that we had struck a chord. Um, and this is local land trusts, it's um, Nature Conservancy, it was uh, the state of Vermont, Fish and Wildlife Department, it was the bishop, it was, um, I'm probably missing lots and lots of people, local uh, Parks Commission, Conservation Board, all kinds of people who shared a vision for natural areas within the urban context. Um, and if I could have the next slide. So we came away from that meeting realizing that we had to form some sort of a par functional partnership in order to push forward some of those items. Originally, we were called the Burlington Open and Natural Lands Conservation and Connection Initiative, which was a huge mouthful. So we started meeting regularly. Here we are in Cindy White's office at Parks and Rec. Um, we formed a steering committee, um, and we thought about lots of different names um, for our organization and thought about sort of, you know, logos. And if I could have the next slide. We really settled upon Burlington Wildways, which we think, you know, says what we do. Um, and it is a partnership organization between Burlington Parks and Rec, Winooski Valley Park District, the Intervale Center, and Rock Point, which are uh, some of the major public-facing landowners who own these natural areas and have a vested interest in um, sharing them with the public and keeping um, uh, uh, the wildlife that they've got on them still there. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, so what are we working on? Um, the, the things that we're really, as a partnership group, focusing on... Oh, I, I just wanted to just take a moment to um, recognize the partners that we have here. Um, we have uh, Cindy White from Parks and Rec and um, Lauren Chicote from the Winooski Valley Park District, Kate Cruzy, who's a local botanist, a member of our steering committee, and Dan Cahill, who's the city land steward for Parks and Rec, um, who are all uh, really active participants in pushing all of these agendas forward. Um, so we're working on things that really we can only do in partnership. Um, and those are uh, uh, cre um, creating a connected trail that moves across the landscape through multiple uh, landowners. So if you want to get from one side of the intervale to the other, we're creating a connected trail to help you do that. Um, we're working on uh, conservation issues that affect all of the landowners um, and coming up with um, uh, ways that we can involve the public, um, consistent stewardship of landscapes. Um, we're trying to work on access, uh, increasing the numbers of people who um, can uh, feel comfortable coming into the outdoors and diversifying what types of people make their way into our natural areas. We're also protecting um, rare plants, um, considering, you know, trying to inventory what we have in the city and make sure that we keep it there. 
Um, and we also, um, one thing that I think I, I really want us to continue to work on is really elevating the status of natural areas and the, for the function that they can provide for the city, um, uh, especially in, in the face of climate change. I think their uh, uh, natural areas and natural based, nature based climate solutions are often con considered to be sort of the forgotten climate solution. And I think we as a city can do a better job of elevating the role and function of our natural areas in climate change mitigation. If I could have the next slide. So what have we done? We have built a first section of um, a connected trail that runs called the Burlington Wildway, and Councillor Bushard joined us for that opening along with the mayor um, in early September. Um, this is a picture of the system map that you'll find out on the trail, and it really runs right along the Winooski. It starts at Salmon Hole. It crosses through the Intervale, but along the river, which is not the way that most people make their way through the Intervale, um, through to the Ethan Allen Homestead, and it goes along the 127 bike path and then crosses over um, Ethan Allen Park and then you're really one very long city block away from the bike path. It's five and a half miles long um, and uh, while it is not, it is a new trail because it's newly marked, it actually just knits together existing pieces of trail that were very poorly signed. Um, um, other than the original section, which I think uh, Councillor Pine told me that he worked on many years ago in CEDO, the, um, the river walk below. Um, Riverside Avenue. Um, if I have the next slide. And amazingly, the trail is beautiful. It mostly runs through floodplain forest. Um, it's quiet and serene and lovely to walk on and easy to, to get through. And um, I could have, we could have the next slide. It's marked with these blazes, which is our logo. Um, walks through multiple ownerships. Next slide, please. Um, it sometimes pops out of the forest and is along the agricultural edge within the Intervale. This is a section that runs through private property in the inter Intervale. There are many owners in the Intervale, even though many of us think of it as one entity, um, which is why we haven't had clear, consistent signage through it. And if I could have the next slide, please. And um, the trail's been open a little bit over a month, and uh, uh, we... Anecdotally, we have the sense that it's getting tremendous usage. It's gotten some publicity. Um, many of the institutions have noticed that there's a real uptick in people asking about the Wild Way, trying to find it, getting onto it, and actually using it. Um, uh, so that's great. We always had the sense that if we built a, you know, if we had clear, well-marked trails, it would encourage people to come out and use them. And if I could have the next slide, please. Um, and I just want to say that this is an example of that. About a week after the trail opened, Vermont Adaptive Sports got in touch with um, uh, Dan Cahill, the city land steward, to say, hey, can we um, run an eco-able adventure out on the Wild Way? We heard about the Wild Way. Um, they serve people with both physical differences and cognitive differences, and they're really trying to encourage people to get out, and they really have very few programs in Burlington. So this is... Um, uh, Nick Marinelli, who's a rec specialist with parks, leading a nature walk um, through, uh, along the Wild Way, across Intervale land. If I can have the next slide. Um, and um, the, the Wild Way doesn't go in all the places that we'd like it to go because we have a lot of broken infrastructure. As a group, we're talking about how we can fundraise for that. Um, and how we can repair some of that infrastructure. We feel like if we continue to build that infrastructure, it will widen the net of who we can bring into, into our areas. Next slide. And I also just want to say, lastly, that um, I really think that um, we need to elevate the status of um, nature-based climate solutions. We need to value what we have in the city um, and, and its contribution to climate change. We're already doing some of that. It's not something that we need to do. These are two pictures of Parks and Rec's tree planting using trees that are grown in the Intervale Conservation Nursery, um, uh, restoring a wet softball field to a, f to a forested area. And if I could have the next slide. We're trying to identify a lot of what we have that's of value in the city. We're inventorying all of the natural areas that we have across multiple ownerships and trying to figure out what their contribution is towards ecosystem services, such as um, uh, canopy cover, uh, uh, flood control, water purification, so on. Um, and lastly, um, and I'm just going to end with this final slide, which is um, a picture of two green herons in a ditch, Anglesby Brook, 
next to um, Champlain School, a wood duck, male and female on the left and right, caught by um, a, a, a wildlife camera that a parent put out. And wh the, what I'd like to illustrate with this is there are many places that are really beautiful that we're going to, you know, that are great places for the public to move through and to, and to enjoy. But there are also places that have a lot of value, um, ecological value for the city that, um, that really aren't going to be great spots for the public to be in. This is a, um, this is a, uh, uh, Anglesby Brook that runs from the golf course along uh, Prospect Parkway, underneath Shelburne Road by China Express, next to the Champlain School, and out into the lake. Um, and it's pretty scrappy in there, but it's got a lot of, it's got a lot of um, value in terms of wetland and water purification and as a wildlife corridor. Thank All right. You. Thank you very much for that presentation. And now I'm going to open up to the council. I'm going to recognize Councilor Busher for a brief comment or a brief question. Um, so it, I don't have a question, President Wright, but um, I wanted to thank you for this, and it was really exciting to be part of that opening of the first Wildways path. Um, I wanted to just acknowledge that in this room there are not only Councillor Pine, but Earhart Manka, who was a city councillor, and they all lived in Ward 1 and were involved in, in the initial pathway along Riverside. Yeah making that happen for all of us and youth conservation also got involved in helping um, create some safe places where it was mucky. Um, so I just, I think that this is, that was the beginning and we had all these parcels of, of trails that weren't connected and so Wild Ways has done a wonderful job in connecting all of those. My one thing that I always am concerned about is um, abuse or overuse, and you touched upon that at the at the end of your presentation, and so I think that's the only cautionary statement that we all have to really look at. Right. If these become really popular, will people stay on the trail and just enjoy what they see and not go on t off the trail and potentially damage some of what is so valuable to all of us? Right. So that's it. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad you gave a plug for our natural air being really one of our huge resources for climate, for the climate crisis and climate control. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Busher. Councillor Jang. Be very quick. Thank you for the presentation. Um, and I'm just remembering Mr. Councillor Dean, who used to be here, was a leader around this area. Um, but my question is specific to your work around bee pollinations. How is this participating in that aspect? And also, do you have a network of, you know, um, residents who are working toward that aspect? I'm going to punt this to Alicia. <laughs> Dan, probably. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Dang. Uh, we are actively um, working with, with groups. I, I, you, you know because you're on the council that we became a bee city, uh, a pollinator city, um, through a resolution, and so we are charged with now, and we wanted to do this anyway, um, finding places that can be converted maybe from mowed grass, you know, to meadowlands, or be, go through the process of being restored as a meadow, and then maybe later as a forest. Um, so we're definitely looking at, at native plants that can be grown in Burlington. We have a, a group of UVM students who are working on a project for their capstone project with a a parcel of land that has a stormwater retention pond on it. So we're trying to look at these pockets of space in the city that could be enhanced for pollinators, because you're absolutely right, the decline in number and also diversity of pollinating insects is alarming. And also, you know, Parks has been doing an amazing job at really sort of looking at its mowing and seeing if it can grow some things up, which I know Dan can speak to a little bit more, but I'll just paraphrase for him. <laughs> or you want to come up? No, just about, uh, I, you need okay. to move along. We, if you want to make a brief comment, Dan? Wait. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but Parks, is really addressing, Parks is really addressing that in how they're mowing, mowing less, letting things grow up for pollinators. Yep. Uh, maybe lastly, next presentation, to touch on it, oh, maybe. Good Great. Yes. Thank Terrific. you. We will. <laughs> Thank you. Any other counselor? 
All right, hearing none, thank you very much, Zoe and Alicia, for that presentation. Thanks. You. And we'll look to hear more from you in the future. Thank you. Item 7.03 is a yearly report from the Church Street Marketplace District Commission. <clears throat> Chairman Jeff Nick, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, first of all, I'd like to start off by saying um, Bill Truax just happens to be in the audience here, and it was uh, Bill's wisdom way back in the day that uh, made this all happen, and we can be thankful for his, uh, his vision. And um, before I get started, I would like to talk about uh, the marketplace uh, strengths today, uh, we some weaknesses and um, some opportunities moving forward. But before I get into that, um, I would really like to, on behalf of the entire commission, give a heartfelt thanks to Ron Redmond for his um, years of efforts and, um, and inspiration and leadership in, um, for the last 20 years, Ron's retiring in, a, in, I guess, another couple of weeks here, and he couldn't be here tonight. Um, but uh, when Ron got started, there was still traffic out on this part of Church Street. Uh, we had vacancy problems on the upper block, and um, with Ron's vision and uh, his efforts to get a million dollars from uh, Senator Leahy's office, um, we really uh, brought the street along. And today, um, thanks to your vote to approve Einstein's tonight, we are 100% occupied on the street. Um, so that's, uh, that's great news. Um, some of the things we've, um, you know, to run a street like this um, in a northern climate, in a small market, um, it's, it's amazing how successful we've been over the years. Um, and a lot of effort goes into that. Um, what makes that happen is a healthy mix of um, nationals and, retail and um, local restaurants and, and retailers. Um, we've got um, some unparalleled ambience, as you all know, and we have um, a great student population that keeps this place humming. Uh, the other thing that really has um, given us a lot of energy lately is the additional hotel rooms in town. Um, we can be very thankful for that. Um, that's, uh, that's really helped a, a great bit. Um, I will say also parking management um, has been, been really helpful lately. Um, thanks to the vision of uh, Chapin Spencer bringing on um, Jeff Paget to help manage the, um, the parking resources that we have, working closely with the BBA. Um, that's really been uh, a nice um, jolt of energy and, and listening to our customers and, and what they need. Um, so we, we do have some limited parking resources downtown, but uh, we're putting those to the best use. Um, and I would like to give a shout out to our maintenance team, uh, Jim Daly, uh, our maintenance foreman, and his crew. They do a yeoman's effort out there in all kinds of weather. Um, and they always rank very high in terms of uh, customer satisfaction whenever we poll our merchants. Um, some of the things we're, we're, we're worrisome of, and hopefully um, when we hear from Brookfield, um, we're going to learn a lot more. But obviously, the loss of Macy's and the mall stores and those parking spaces um, has been, um, been, been a bit of a struggle for us. Um, not to say that we didn't want this to happen. All the merchants are 100% behind this redevelopment. Um, and we're all looking forward to seeing the, uh, the next rendition of that. Um, I would also like to um, mention that um, some of the national, some of the things we're worried about, though, on the national front is um, some of the national retailers are teetering. And so this all could change, you know, our success um, is, is fragile, I guess I will say. Um, so we want to be, be do everything we can uh, to keep the, uh, the momentum going down here. Um, so that's uh, something else we need to be concerned about. Um, and lastly, um, the antisocial behavior um, that we witness on the street um, and it's where it goes in ebbs and flows, but uh, that we're hearing from all of our customers and fee payers that that has risen to a level where it's giving us great concern. Um, and one of the things the commission did vote to ask the council to consider a number of, of um, ordinance proposals, but one in particular I think that could be very helpful is to limit the sale of alcohol, off-premise alcohol sales um, before 10 a.m. Um, I think that's causing a lot of the disturbances out there. And I think that one little change could, could, uh, could, could really make a difference. Um, so I will see, uh, close in just saying uh, we're, we're very successful today, 
but the success is fragile, <clears throat> and we'll have to do everything moving forward to make sure that we stay strong. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nick. Open it up to the council for questions of Jeff Nick. Councillor Tracy. So two questions, uh, the first of which has to do with uh, an issue that was raised by a constituent um, having to do with um, the fact that uh, some business owners will leave their doors open when active cooling and or heating is taking place and just wondering how we can really get a hold of that because it seems like a complete waste of energy and one that may or may not actually draw customers in. So wondering how you think we can deal with that and then the second question um, has to do with bike racks on Church Street and bike parking. I feel like we can do a lot better in terms of bike parking on Church Street and wondering how the commission is seeing itself as um, being involved with or considering addi adding additional bike parking to the Church Street Marketplace. Thank you. Great questions. Um, th the commission has discussed these issues in particular, but uh, to the, uh, the doors. Um, it is, it is disconcerting. I will say, you know, I don't like wasting energy, and, and it, uh, it's, it's something that is hard, very challenging to manage. Um, some stores, I mean, I'd like to say, yeah, we could mandate that everybody keeps their doors closed, but some people, some stores have airlock entrance ways, so the front door could be, the outer door could be open, the inner door could still be closed. We're not sure who's heating the place, you know, at different seasonal times, it's okay to leave a door open because you're not losing any energy. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts when you really think it through in terms of is it reasonable to suggest that we could just mandate closing the doors. Um, whether or not it does bring in customers, I, I hear that it does, but I'm not a retailer, so I, I, but I think it, it, the, uh, the thought is that it helps, helps bring in retailers. So. I hope that answers your question. Um, to bike racks, we have so many things on the street. I'd like to think that we could put bike, we do have some bike racks on the street. I'd like to think that if we found locations that they would kind of be on the corners, if you will, just off the street. Still, I mean, there's still bike racks on the street, but we have so much activity. And sometimes when the street is just overloaded with people, it would, they would get, tend to get in the way. Um, so I'd like to think that we could find additional spaces just kind of on the periphery of our street. So I, I certainly appreciate both of those things. I think that we can certainly do more on the, the closing of the doors factor. And then additionally on the bike thing, one of the things that I think we see is that a lot of people, when in the absence of bike racks, will lock them to nearly anything. And I think that that can really create kind of a junky look to a street when people just lock bikes willy nilly. Um, and also I think that we hear from shop owners that parking is an issue and I think that we need to draw a clear parallel to when people are able to bike and able to do so easily and, and consistently and find, finding parking at their destination, it becomes a much more viable alternative to, to get them out of their cars. So I think that anything you can do to, to, to drive that bike parking on the street uh, up would be really helpful. Thank yep. you. Thank you, Councillor Tracy. Councillor Pine and then Councillor Busher. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the uh, voters didn't obviously care for the downtown improvement district the way it was proposed. I'm wondering if the commission, it's not really the commission's issue per se, but it is definitely, since you all are invested and care deeply about downtown, what are the thoughts on how to move forward on that issue? We would like to continue the effort to see if we can expand the downtown improvement district. We, we were very disappointed that that did not succeed. Um, I, I think a lot of the, the thought was, I think the word privatization was thrown around a lot and there was some fear that the business community would, would take things over and I tried to explain to folks that that wasn't the effort at all. Um, it's really largely what we do other than the maintenance on the street is marketing and branding and advertising for our merchants and that's something city governments typically don't do, um, the business community does. So, you know, with that in mind, and with the understanding that anything else we do is really, would be really under contract or through what the city might allow this new downtown improvement district to do. So I think the city really has all the control moving forward if this effort were to gain speed again and we did expand the district and made it a private entity. Right now, it's a little challenging. Um, and I will say that the mayor has done a great job working within the confines of the charter um, to remove some obstacles for us um, that 
were in the way that we've been dealing with for many, many years. Um, so that's been very helpful, but now we've kind of reached the, the end and what we can achieve vis-a-vis -vis what the charter limits us to do. Um, so I'd love to see this gain momentum again. Since the president got up to leave, I think I'll ask one more question. Um, did, <laughs> did, the, did the issue of using capital funds, did that issue get addressed? Jeff, could you speak to that? No, it has not. Um, How do we do that? Do we have to go to the voters to do that? That would be the charter change as well, oh, yes. Wow. Okay. So, Councillor Busher's next, followed by Councillor Jang, and then I think Councillor Freeman. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, my question, and, and I missed a little bit of your presentation, I apologize, has to do with your report regarding retail sales and your forecast, I mean, your recap of 2008, which seemed pretty straight on. Um, and I really wish that Brookfield was listening to this. Um, so I'm gonna wait for just a second. Um, um, because I really think that this is germane to have, have them hear this in, re, in addition. Um, so in 2008, your, your recap of retail sales was pretty constant. But in 2019, um, your retail sales are not tracking as well as they have in the past. And you say that there are a number of concerns um, and that the, um, that the retailers have identified a few things. It's the loss of the mall parking. It's the loss of Macy's. Um, and other mall retailers, which were a, an attraction, um, and the increased popularity of e-commerce, and also some of the other um, behaviors that we have on the street that are troubling to some people that come downtown. Um, I know that this time of year oftentimes ramps up, um, and so sales are out for holidays. Um, usually is when we do a lot of our business. Um, can, you, can you at least give me an indication of uh, what pers how much we'd have to do in this period of time? Do you have any idea in order to come out as uh, out the same level we were in 2018? Yeah, that's, that's a lot to answer, but um, the, um, what I'm hearing is that uh, with the, all of those things, the loss of the mall and the parking were huge impacts on, on and I think the, the increased number of, of hotel rooms kind of softened that blow for us. Um, so, you know, and, and, and this holiday season is actually six days less shorter than the last holiday season, so it is going to be challenging. Um, and e-commerce and... All of those things are, are real challenges, um, and I think we have to do everything we can. A lot of, well, one thing I was, the biggest thing about a customer experience is coming downtown, parking conveniently and easily, and not be witnessing antisocial behavior. Those are the two biggest things that stand in our way of future success. So, you know, we have a lot of parking, <clears throat> but it's kind of in the wrong location. So everybody gets to this one garage and then they have to cross Church Street to find another garage. And we're doing a better, starting to do a better job of showing people where the other parking is, but for years we did not. And so to show people where that parking is, the other thing we're doing is to, to relocate, hopefully relocate some employees out of this garage. And this is where the parking management comes in. If we can relocate employees, and reduce the cost in the outer garages down by the, the um, Macy's, the old Macy's, that would certainly help. Um, we're trying to do everything we can to free up parking for customers. Okay, well, thank you. I mean, it, I, it was a difficult question to answer, <clears throat> but I'm, I'm really concerned about this and the long time that we're going to go without activity in Macy's and, and the lack uh, of parking. I, I will so say thank one you. thing, I, I would thank, thank Brookfield for their, their um, their donation right. to the marketplace, and, and that is going to go towards um, advertising and parking management efforts to enhance the customer experience. Great. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor Busher. Councillor Jang. Um, thank you very much for the presentation and for your work for our commercial downtown district. I think it's, it's important. 
But I wanted to go back to one aspect you just raised here. Um, pushing for the sale of alcohol to be like around 10. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know how would you know that? And also, if there are a list of recommendations that you can send us in writing in making sure that our downtown is safe for everyone. Yes. Well, I, I park in the marketplace garage every morning, and between 7 and 7.30, I see people drinking Bud Light on the street. So, and by, by 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, they're drunk. So just my witnessing that alone, and I know um, I've talked to police officers on the street, and they also agree that if we could, if we could eliminate the, the ability to purchase alcohol that early in the morning, um, it would, they believe, and I believe, that it would really, really help us um, deal with these antisocial behaviors. And it really, a lot of it just stems from alcohol. It really does. Um, I mean, there's other things too, but that to me seems like a, an easy one to, to figure out. Thank you, Councillor Chang. Um, all right, I'm going to thank Councillor Freeman, and then we're going to wrap this up. Thank Councilor you, Freeman. and I'm, I'm glad that Councillor Jang was asking about the alcohol-related behavior. That was, I think you covered a lot of it, and um, I was just sort of wondering in general. I guess my only, and I'll do, I can do more research onto this because I've heard it come up several times about sort of the influence on alcohol and alcohol sales and um, the hours avail of availability um, and how that's impacting maybe like crime or violence and or behavior in our community. And um, the only sort of red flag for me is what underlying issues are being exacerbated by alcohol in, in the sense that um, perhaps the alcohol alone isn't really... Um, it's a factor, but it's not necessarily the key, or I'm not sure to what degree it's a key influencer, but the, the, you know, the information that you just provided is helpful and I can certainly do more research onto it, but that was the only red flag for me because it does, um, yeah, I just wanted to, make, I wanted to make sure we weren't just sort of saying, well, it's just the alcohol or it, it almost in like a prohibition sort of sense, like if we get rid of all the alcohol, then all the other problems will go away. And um, I think there's some underlying issues um, that can cause people to be violent. So that was really my question and comment, and I think you spoke to it, and I'll do more research. I don't know if you have any more information to speak to that point, but I've just heard it come up several times now. Mr. Nick, uh, any, you did address it, but do you have any other, other comment to that? I, I'm not an expert. I just see, I know what I see with my own eyes, and I know that that would be kind of an easy fix, if you will. There are certainly other issues at play here that I, I'm not qualified to speak to, um, but this would take care of a, a good portion of our, our problems. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Nick. We appreciate it. Thank you for your service on the Marketplace Commission. And with that, we will go to item number 7.04, and that is a communication and an update from Brookfield on City Place Project. And if you would each identify yourself for the record. And we have only two microphones, but uh, I can pass them between you. And again, remember, as I've said to everybody else tonight, make sure the microphone is really close. Because I promise you, everyone wants to hear what you have to say. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Anin Olson. That's spelled A-A-N-E-N-O-L-S-E-N. -E uh, my name is Peter Calkins, C-A-L-K-I-N-S. And just to say, that's not close enough. Oh, my, oh, my name is It's going to need to be right, very close, Calkins. like this is where I have it. All right, right there. Yeah. Uh, Chelsea Ziegelbaum. Um, I am a manager with Brookfield. Uh, thank you. Um, good evening. Uh, like I said, I'd like to reintroduce myself. We were here uh, almost exactly 60 days ago. Um, my name is Anand Olson. I'm a vice president of development, of mixed-use development with Brookfield Properties. Um, you, we've introduced Peter Calkins. Peter Calkins is a senior member of our team, works out of our Boston office, um, and will be uh, an integral part of the project going forward. He has a, uh, a long history in uh, office development and just complex downtown mixed-use developments. 
Um, so we're, we're uh, happy to, to have him join the team. <clears throat> uh, we'd like to just you know, thank the, the council and the public for their patience with this process. Um, we've been working diligently over the last uh, two months to craft a plan that delivers uh, a project that is right for the city, the market, and our partnership. Um, additionally, our, our local team of, of local contractors has been working hard to complete the temporary restoration uh, right-of-way and reopen the public restrooms within the mall. Um, the temporary parking plan on Cherry and Bank Street is well underway and will be available for public use very shortly. Um, all fees associated with the encumbrance license have been paid and renovations to the public restrooms has commenced and will be operational before the uh, holiday season. Um, we, we, we'd like to kind of show you our thoughts on where we've been for the last 60 days. Um, we, we've got some graphics that we're going to show. Um, Kind of the, the headlines are um, the while the, the scope and um, density and, and scale of the project is is largely the same. Um, what we have have kind of learned are the housing market is very strong. Um, there's there's strong demand for housing downtown. Um, there is uh, UVMMC and its uh, relocation to downtown um, is an extremely important. Uh, element for us and for the city. Um, and then um, street level retail is vital to the success of any place making. So uh, the, the plan will um, continue to show uh, retail at the, at the street level. Um, let's see. The other kind of big headline is that while the, the, the scope is, is the same, it's now spread out over two blocks. And what this allows us to do what, what this allows us to do, by taking the office component out of the middle block, which was the, um, what, what is affectionately known as the hole in the ground, is uh, now um, located in the Macy's building. So what we're proposing is a, an adaptive reuse of the Macy's building, putting our office tenant in there, thereby uh, reducing the overall height of the project of the middle block by more than 50 feet. Uh, it's 25% less dense. It simplifies the uh, structural system, um, meaning it, it kind of simplifies the construction technique, thereby lowers construction costs. Um, the plan also maintains the connection of the street grid, um, as well as some of the previously approved amenities like the rooftop observation deck and the community space. <clears throat> um, so I, we can kind of walk through um, what we brought here. Yeah, no, I want to just go back. Okay, so <clears throat> what we started to talk about the last time we were here is we're taking this three-block approach um, all the way from Church Street through Macy's. Um, so what you see here um, to the right is Church Street, uh, the, the existing mall, uh, the middle block, and then uh, what you see in blue is the, is the Macy's building. <clears throat> this is a, um, a cross-section of the middle block. So it show, what it's designed to show is kind of a, a stacking diagram and basic massing of the, of the proposed project. Um, this is not architecture. This is uh, just kind of a, what we use is for planning purposes. Um, as you can see, the dotted line is the previously approved project, um, and our the new proposed project is is eight levels of residential, over uh, over retail, a simplified parking structure in the middle, uh, and a hotel use over uh, retail along Bank Street. So it's uh, kind of Cherry Street on your left, Bank Street on your right. Um, again, a similar cross-section through Macy's, uh, through the existing Macy's building. What we're proposing is, um, you know, reusing the existing building um, and using it for uh, an office tenant uh, with retail, restaurant, entertainment, something else on the, uh, on the ground level. Um, we, started, we started playing with some, um, 
schemes to um, reskin the Macy's building, open it up, um, transform it from a, uh, you know, kind of an historical um, department store building, which is, you know, blank walls. They really only care what happens on the inside of the building to a more uh, street-focused, uh, outward-facing uh, outward facing building. Um, that's why you see uh, new, new windows um, kind of punched in the, uh, the Cherry Street facade. And this is kind of a, it's not really to scale, it's, it was kind of a quick artist rendition of, um, of kind of the new massing of the plan. Um, like I said, it's a little bit out of scale, but it kind of gives you this, the scope of, of what we're talking about. Um, so <clears throat> our, our plan over the next um, two months is to kind of advance the design um, to a point where we can start um, the public approval process, we can negotiate with our tenants, and um, you know, try to be under construction next year. Um, we're ha you know, and we're happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you. So we'll open it up to the council, and again. I want to emphasize when you are answering questions, have the microphone as close to your mouth as you can. Um, Councilor Roof. Thank you, President Wright. Thank you for the presentation. Um, sort of, I want to jump right to this, and I'm, I'm not going to take a, a ton of time. I think we all have a ton of questions, but <clears throat> a big part of the value of this project for me, and I know a, a lot of others, uh, was the, the added benefit of, of new housing in the downtown. Um, with this shift, looks like eight, eight stories of residential. Can you give us a sense to the degree that you, you, you can, and I hope that you can be relatively specific yep. on what the, what the differences might be around the housing that was expected under the original plan and what, we're, what we can expect to see with, uh, with new housing units coming online as part of this plan? Uh, this, this new plan actually preserves uh, every single unit that was proposed in the original plan mm -hmm. and may even have space for more. So we're, we are tracking someplace between 280 and 300 units as was originally approved. Okay. And then second question again, high level, uh, with regard to the, the three block plan, it, 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 just to be clear, the block three, the Church Street side, there's no contemplated improvements or changes to be made on, on that block, is that correct? No, not at this time. We, um, it's strategic. We, we want to kind of tackle the big problems first. The, 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 the mall, we've got a fantastic leasing department. Uh, we own malls all across the country. We're, uh, we're going to sick them on it and, uh, and do their best to, to kind of fill that space as well. So as of now, it would go block, just looking at the, at the, at the diagram, start with the Macy's block, block three, and then move to the, 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 main, the main block right now, block two, Correct. and then block one would be essentially the same as it is now uh, until further notice? Correct, and we, we will start, we will continue to work on that, and, and as um, tenants present themselves, as opportunities present themselves, we won't let them pass by, but it's, it's, um, it's an operating asset today, and um, we want to concentrate on the, 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 the bigger picture. And last question again, high level, um, can you speak at all to the agreement or the, the conversations that are, are being had with the medical center? Um, we are working with them to uh, fulfill their needs. Their, um, their largest issue is honestly is parking. Um, like uh, some of the previous uh, speakers have, have talked about is, is the availability of parking downtown. Um, we are also working with the marketplace. We're working with the BBA. We're working with the city um, to kind of do a comprehensive audit of the, of the parking downtown and, and figure out how we can be, a, uh, how we can be an asset. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Roof. And Mr. Olson, I just want to make sure I heard it. Did you say the current plan now has 200 and 280 to 300 apartments? That's correct. And what was the number before? It was 289. It's the same number? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Councilor Pine is up next to be followed by Councilor Busher. Thanks, Mr. President. The, um, the process for securing uh, Tenants is obviously your your big focus for the additional for the office space that remains and the retail. It sounds like that's correct. About how much office remains unaccounted for, assuming that the medical center <clears throat> takes its portion. 
you, Chelsea, do you remember? Um, I, I think it's Sorry. about 30 to 40,000 square feet. Yeah, order of magnitude, that's what I was wondering. Um, do you believe that you'll be able to, do you have an existing financing commitment, but I assume that's contingent upon certain variables that are related to percentage of office that is already leased and, and such like that, and retail that's already committed to, to, to tenants? Oh, yeah, so. uh, yeah, there are, um, there are large format retail tenants out there, retail entertainment, kind of these hybrid um, uh, tenants that are out there. So, yes, they are available. The, the question also goes back to maybe last, it seems like almost a year ago, we, we discussed financing and whether you had, um, you know, essentially a term sheet and, and an executed term sheet. And at the time, that was the case. Where does that stand now? It remains executed. Um, the, the the bank uh, we've asked them to kind of um, to hold our place, and they're doing so. So we you know we, we owe them an update, and they're get, kind of getting it right now. Okay. And lastly, the um, well, let's just say the word was around the around co the community was that some of the uh, office rents were very let's say extremely hot on the high side beyond competitive, but really pushing the market. So I'm wondering if that issue is, is come into more balance with the local market conditions. It's something we're, it's something we're reviewing as we speak. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pine, Councillor Busher, and then Tracy, and then Jane. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you so much for giving us an update. This is appreciated by the whole community. Um, and um, I'm really happy to see something and to hear the words. And also there was an electronic um, submission also for us to look at earlier. I hadn't really had too much time to really digest that. But um, uh, I have a couple of questions you said. Um, so I'm, I wanted to understand or just make sure that I understood the process going forward with the new design. Um, it's really important that the public have a chance to weigh in, and I just didn't know how that was going to unfold and what your expectation was for that. Um, this question is more, is broader, and so you might just touch upon it, but it really is important for the community because they're anxious to see what's being proposed. They'll be ecstatic something is being proposed, and um, but they'd like to have a chance to look at that. Having, having asked that question about process, um, these are more nitty gritty questions. Right. You said hopefully you would um, get going next year. What is next year? Is it 2020 or 2021? Uh, that is 2020. I think 2020. You, I think you said within the year. 2020, yes. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I understood. I mean, that's what I think next year is too, yes. but I wanted to make sure I got <laughs> that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, you, talk, you talked about people are asking you things that I know you can't answer completely, but you did touch upon the number of housing units. The square footage for retail, has that shrunk from the original plan or is that about the same? What can you say about that? Um, the square footage of retail has shrunk from the original plan, mostly though in that we took away most of the second story retail that we had in the second plan um, because we think the ground floor retail is more valuable and is probably more of an amenity to the community. So it has shrunk um, in terms of retail space, but um, we also now do plan to add more retail space to the Macy's building, which we didn't have before, uh, obviously since Macy's left. Um, and then we just pretty much eliminated the second level retail. So the reason I ask is that the original plan had a lot of retail and then there was, and that was early on and then it shrunk because of changing times. And so I am concerned because I do think we need to augment the retail downtown. Um, and, and so I, I'm, I'll look forward to understanding what what you ultimately end up with, but I, I certainly hope that people still go to stores. I just want to make sure everyone knows that. No, they may we, not we buy in the store, unfortunately, but they go to stores to look, yes. Yeah, I do think if you look at those sections, you'll see that along the street frontage okay. um, on both sides, we're pretty consistent with having full retail other than entries into building lobbies and that kind of thing. So 
as Chelsea said, it's really the second story, less accessible retail that we've taken okay. away. And you touched upon, and then I want to have you just go back to the process because I can see President Wright having a fit here. Um, the number of <laughs> parking spaces, yet. the number of parking spaces, you really can't speak to that. Is that what I heard you answer to uh, for Councillor Pine when he was talking about this? Um, because we had we wanted to make sure there were enough spaces for the units that you create. We wanted to make sure there was enough space for the medical center and any other commercial. And we wanted to make sure that there were enough spaces for people who wanted to come downtown to shop. And so what can you tell me about parking space? Um, I, I, I guess we can only say that it, it will be adequate for the, the uses that we're proposing plus you know, some additional spaces for um, public. Uh, we, we all come from a retail background. Our company owns 150 malls. We, we, uh, we completely understand the need for parking and, and readily available parking. Okay. Um, so parking is, is a big part of our focus at this point. Um, and working with um, your team um, and just in analyzing um, the, the data that's coming back from your new parking management system is, is going to be, you know, it's going to be very valuable to, to the kind of the whole community. Okay. And covered parking for bicycles, et cetera, would Correct. be really yeah. important. Okay. Yeah. And then the last thing was the question that I asked, which I know is a little difficult, but how do you envision, how do you, how do you see yourself intersecting or, or uh, with the community as a whole, with the new plan? What do you see that process looking like? Um, we are, uh, we've already um, kind of indicated to the CDNR that we would um, come and meet with them. Um, I believe there are a couple of NPAs in the, in the area that are obviously interested. Um, so we are kind of putting together what we're calling our uh, comprehensive community outreach program. So we, we will, you will see us around. I'm not going to speak for anyone else on the council, but I would really like to see, uh, I'm going to speak to the mayor, I'm looking at the mayor, just for, but I think it would be really nice to have a meeting in this room so that it doesn't matter whether you live in Ward 1 or Ward 6 or wherever, that you could come here and, and see what's being proposed. I, I'd like okay. that to be really open. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Busher. Councillor Tracy, to be followed by Councillor Jang, Polino, Mason, and Roof. Thank you very much, and I would say that also thank you for the update. I certainly, you know, appreciate um, the, you know, the developers actually coming and doing what they told us that they, that they were going to do. I think it has been incredibly disappointing for the public to continually be given uh, essentially non-updates, so it's nice to actually have something substantial on which to go. Um, however, what I would say is that I view this as one among many steps that you need to take in order to restore trust with this community because um, it's really at a, at a, at a, at a, been at a real low point and the, the, the impact that the, the failure to execute um, and to move forward has been pretty, pretty substantial on the community. And I look at this design and on the one hand, I'm you know, happy to see a project that is significantly scaled down because that was one of the big concerns and something that we said uh, was problematic about this project from the beginning, which is that it was out of scale with Burlington. However, it is incredibly frustrating to have been saying those things uh, and having been pretty much ignored um, throughout the process, not hearing a lot, of, not seeing a lot of responsiveness to those comments, uh, and then to have the larger project fail, have it have a tremendous impact on our city and then have us you know, have to be in a position now of taking much more time with those impacts playing out over the course of several years. So um, I think that Councillor Busher's point regarding public in engagement and actually listening to the people who uh, live in this community uh, is crucial. Um, I hope that it's not just something that uh, is uh, just a, a perfunctory step that you see as, as sort of checking boxes, which is very much what it felt like in the last case, uh, and that, that, that there is real input that's taken, uh, specifically because we see the program of uses change substantially, namely the inclusion now of a hotel. At no point was a hotel discussed in the initial uh, design of this. That's a substantial change. We've seen numerous hotels come into our downtown uh, in recent years um, in terms of different, you know, different uses. And it seems as though um, the public should have an opportunity to weigh in if that's a use that they want. And if, in fact, the public uh, is not in favor of that, that we look at some other potential uses uh, for that. Because um, 
I think that folks know what they would like to see in their downtown and they need to be legitimately in included. So MPAs are a step, having meetings here is a step, but it's not just having the meetings. It's really, in my mind, engaging the public and actually listening to them because it quite frankly doesn't feel like you did that and that's a big reason why we're here today. Thank you, Councillor Tracy. Any comments or want me to move on? No. Councillor Jang. Yeah, thank you very much again for being here. And I feel as if you starting to like Burlington. You know. I, lo I love Burlington, that's oh. not okay. <laughs> but you know, I really, we, uh, uh, from my heart, thank you. Thank you for being here. And also I'm very glad to hear that somewhat you have listened to the concern of the citizens of Burlington. The project was too big. And it seems now it is tailored down to 10. Is it 10 or 7? Eight stories? Uh, eight, nine. Eight, it's, nine. Yeah. Okay. So I think that is a great step from my perspective. Um, and also the parking, you know, even though it went down, but the parking will still be the same. I think all of those are great things that we need to celebrate with you. Um, but we had an agreement, right? We had an agreement of that 14 story, and I don't think what you're trying to do here is not to alter that agreement. Are you thinking of bringing a new agreement and we start over again, go forward? Or would you like just alter the previous agreement and then we try to move forward? I wanna hear. I mean, we, we don't have any thoughts on that right now. I mean, we're working with the administration and, and your, your planning department in, you know, in kind of working out the technical, the technical steps. Um, so, we, we really don't have any thoughts on that right now. Okay. So I, I really wish then you had a, a, an idea, you know, about at least when you're coming in front of the council to tell us a little bit. Um, but in any case, in the construction industry, there is this term that we use that called liquidated damages. Have you spoken to the, con the administration about it? And you probably heard many concerns that were raised here by our church street marketplace, by our residents here, around the lack of services, around the lack of um, business because of the, uh, the project that failed. Um, and well, was just wondering if you had a chance to speak with the administration about it and how we will work that forward. No, we, we have not contemplated the, the, uh, the concept of liquidated damages. Um, it's, it's not in our existing an agreement, and um, I would hope that it did not get, would not get to that point. Okay. Um, and now I wanted to also know who is your owner project manager? Do you used to have one in the past with um, like someone who represents you here um, to really work with the city around the project to move forward? Uh, you're, you're looking at them. You're, you're looking at you know the, the project team, as as well as we do have on the ground uh, management. We've got um, our mall manager, our uh, operations manager from the mall. So we do have a number of, uh, of employees on the ground here. Our development partner also has a number of uh, uh, employees on the ground in Burlington. So it's it's going to be a, a real team effort. Okay. Yeah, and our our entire contracting and um, uh, design team is all local as well. Okay. So basically, you're just telling us what's in your mind, but we haven't get into the nitty gritty of what you want to propose to us. That's correct. Thank you. Th thank you, Councillor Jane. Councillor Polino. <clears throat> well, I want to thank you for coming and really uh, for submitting these drawings. I, I, I know that they're just drawings. They're very preliminary, but... Um, I think they say a lot. Um, I think that you've spent a lot of time doing some due diligence. Uh, I met with you guys back in, I think it was May, and we were talking about the different components to what could make a project profitable. Um, I speak on behalf of myself. It would be my goal to make you guys the biggest taxpayer in Vermont, and we want you to be successful. So I welcome substantial changes. I appreciate um, you know, the hotel, one of my more nitty-gritty questions actually uh, was, one, 
how big is the hotel in terms of, do you have an idea in terms of rooms? Uh, right now we have approximately 175 rooms. And uh, my second also question that I thought uh, is on that drawing, the mid block drawing, there's a shaded area um, over the parking. Does that mean that this uh, project has a potential to expand in the future? And if you go down to the last slide. Make sure you're using microphones, please. M microphones. Right. What you're looking at is the, the residential building is a U-shaped building, and you're looking at a piece of it in the background. I, I, I see what you mean. So it's like an L-shaped, so yeah. that would be... Yeah, uh, it's, it's in, the, in the back. Yeah. But. All right, and uh, I think Councillor Jang talk, talked about the fact that, you know, we're no longer talking about 14 stories, 10 stories is the mid-block, and that includes the hotel as well? That's correct. Um, so <coughs> I, I appreciate that because there are a lot of people who really support this project, but we're concerned about, you know, the facade of Burlington in terms of height and obstruction, views of the lake from UVM and so forth and so on. Um, Lastly, I think I'd like to end with a positive note that as, men, as much hardship as you've had, you know, in working out the kinks of this project with your partner, um, you still included the community space on top of the hotel. And I think that if that comes through, that would be very, very um, positive for, the, for all of Burlington. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Polino. Councillor Mason. Thank you, President Wright. Um, thank you for being here tonight. Um, it's encouraging to hear the deadlines, or at least your soft commitment to the deadlines you've put out, but to sort of avoid the over-enthusiasm, I think some of us have magnified, like what are the potentials, you know, for delay? As you're looking, I appreciate you're saying here, but construction projects have delays. So rather than be Lucy, you know, who sort of gets snookered by Charlie Brown, or again, mm -hmm. like what are, what are the potential delays that would, you know, not permit a construction on the time frame that you're looking at? Um, so they're regulatory. Um, any uh, regulatory delays going through the, the public approval process. Uh, the, any legal challenges um, would also be a, a delay. And any um, uh, kind of delays to our, uh, our leasing velocity, trying to, to kind of lease the, uh, lease the space. Okay. So those are our um, big hurdles. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Councillor Hansen. Councillor Roof, I'm going to come back to you when other councillors have had their first shot. Councillor Hansen. Thanks. Um, so we talked a bit about the parking. I think there's two ways to deal with uh, parking issues and parking constraints. I hear a lot of folks that are stuck in this ideology of simply adding supply and more supply. Um, in the electricity sector in Vermont, we took a different approach, which was to actually reduce demand. Uh, as a more economical, environmentally sustainable way to deal with the issue. Um, we focused on efficiency and bringing down that demand rather than just continually building more infrastructure to meet a growing supply. Um, I think it's really critical that we take the same approach in transportation and actually focus on demand management. Um, so getting people out of cars so that we don't actually need to provide, the, provide this high level of parking. Um, so, especially being right in the heart of downtown, um, and as we're having a lot of conversations around parking, around sustainable transportation, and around getting the city off of fossil fuels, um, I'm curious to hear about any transportation demand management plans that you have um, in order to support folks um, traveling to and from this development without a car. So, for example, not, you know, not having folks who, who maybe live in the building and don't own a car, not having them subsidize parking for other residents. So decoupling the price of parking from the price of housing as one example, charging the right amount for parking so that the users are paying rather than everyone else subsidizing it. Um, and anything you're doing with you know, transit incentives or information surrounding transit to, to really help folks who are using this space, who are living in this space, um, to be able to travel sustainably. So that's my first question is, any plans around transportation demand management? Um, 
We had not uh, contemplated anything yet specifically on that topic. Um, I mean, they're all great <laughs> ideas and, and, and a noble effort, and we'll, we'll work with the city in any way that you'd like us to, to work with you on, on those initiatives. Great. Yeah, I'd love to follow up on a that. Lot of, and a lot of times, um, it, it's, it's about the tenant. It's about, um, and those workers um, in the building and their individual needs, unfortunately. Um, we're kind of the, as the developer, uh, yeah, we're, yeah, we're the vessel for these people to kind of get their, their jobs done. And it, it's important for um, especially um, uh, office, you know, office owners and, and office operators and retail operators to be able to get their employees to these, to attract employees to these downtown businesses and parking ends up being one of them. So um, we're happy to work with, with the city and with our tenants to, to try to find a solution. Great. Yeah, I think that's, that's a critical point. And yeah, we absolutely need to work with prospective tenants to, to make that system work. Um, look forward to working on that. And my other question is around um, district heating um, and, and utilizing that um, to, for heating of the building and wanted to ask where your commitment lays there. This is something that's obviously been baked in from the beginning and, and just want to hear you speak to your commitment around district heating. Uh, I mean, it's, it's an ongoing issue and as we get into the like, you know, nuts and bolts of the, the design, um, we will uh, address it at that point. Okay. So, and, and are you still committed, though, to, to using a district heating system? I, I, can't, I, I can't commit to, to that today. Um, if, if there is an existing agreement in place, um, we will honor it. Um, but it's, it's something we will get into as we um, start designing the project. Okay, I, all right. I for one find that a little bit concerning, but um, we'll continue to push on that front and I really hope that you will follow through on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hanson. Councillor Paul. Uh, thank you, President Wright. Um, so I'll echo what everyone else has already said. Thank you very much for being here this evening and thank you for sharing, um, sharing information with us and with the community. Uh, we've all been waiting for this. Uh, certainly, everyone in this community has been waiting for this, um, so thank you. Um, I, I, uh, uh, I always like to feel that the glass is half full as opposed to has half empty. I, I, don't, I don't think that we need to go backwards. I think we need to move forwards. And I think that you have, to a large degree, listened to the community. Um, if there is one thing that uh, we have heard time and time again, and you've heard it time and time again from me as well as from many at this table. The, built, the project needed to be more um, in line with the skyline of Burlington, and I think that you have done that, so thank you. Um, I think that's extremely important and will be um, very important to many people in this community, so thank you. Um, I also think that we need housing. Um, I'd like if, if you could to talk about uh, if, you, if you know at this point, if you have any, um, any plans in terms of how you're going to be working the residential side of that, um, and as you I'm sure know, our, in, our inclusionary zoning, what, you, what your plans are with that, if there's any plans to do um, anything more than that. Um, and then the other is retail. You had said that, you know, I, I look at this and you can see that there's less parking um, or where the parking was in the first iteration, that's where the, uh, some of the height came from on the other parts of the, of the structure. Um, with that gone, the, um, uh, the retail does seem to be less retail than before, although there's now retail at what isn't what was the Macy's building, which in the first iteration that we had a couple of years ago, they didn't have the Macy's building, so there was no retail there. So I'm not really sure if it's a gain or loss on retail, and maybe you could speak to just those two items, please. Um, so as far as, I, I, I think your residential question was going to unit mix, like, like I, I, 
Oh, well, affordability, we're going to meet the originally um, approved requirement, which was 20%. Um, we're committed to that. Yes. Um, and the retail, um, being retail developers, we, um, we're kind of focusing on um, the most important uh, frontages of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the project, which is uh, Cherry Street and uh, Bank Street. Um, and and it's, it's kind of a, a simple urban planning um, exercise as well, where your kind of your main streets or your main, um, you know, pedestrian connections to back and forth to the lake, back and forth to the hotels, um, and then the side streets become more um, service-oriented, um, where we can kind of enter parking garages and, and just take some of that, you know, um, kind of some of the car traffic and things like that and kind of put them on the side streets. So we're, we're kind of concentrating our, our retail efforts on the, on the most valuable places um, because just vacant retail doesn't do anything for anybody. So um, what we're doing is we're just concentrating on, on the most important spaces. Okay. Um, and then the last comment I had is that uh, I think it would be, um, I think a few people have, maybe someone has mentioned this as well, is that the community space being at the top of the hotel, I hope that there will be an effort to not only to engage the public on the project itself, but also to truly engage the, pro the, the community on the community space. Um, a lot of people are really going to value that space and uh, um, while you can't make everyone happy, I think it would be great to have some sort of ability um, either through a meeting but also through some sort of uh, web presence to be able to hear from the, uh, the public as you move forward. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Paul. Councillor Shannon. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation, and I want to say that I think this is very exciting on many fronts. I think that, um, I mean, first of all, to, to actually hear progress is, you know, a re relieving a lot of our fears, even though there's still a long ways to go and a lot of hurdles that still need to be overcome. Uh, this, uh, this certainly makes me more optimistic. Um, I was never fond of 14-story buildings. I said it many times in the approval process that I was willing to support that because the site really needed to be redeveloped. And I can see here that um, the opportunity that came up when the Macy's building was acquired really had not been taken advantage of until you took a step back and redesigned this, and that also provides the opportunity for reducing the height um, and still including the whole program that was what we talked about and, um, and getting the office space built for the hospital, which is a high priority for us. I, I also um, want to kind of echo uh, Councillor Hansen's comments that uh, that the parking, I think that the parking for the hospital is probably going to, you know, they're going to demand what they demand and you have to provide it. And I know even VEIC left downtown because of a lack of parking, which is concerning. Um, so you're probably not going to have, you're probably going to have to do what you have to do to accommodate them. But on the residential sign, side, I think that, that this community really values, um, you know, trying to live without a car, and it's really hard to do here. And anything that you can do within your program to help people live without a car, it is a community value, and it is an amenity to your tenants. And it's a lifestyle that we aspire to. And you may have a real opportunity here to help us reach, you know, what, what we're hoping for. And I also think that district heat is a really important part of that as well. And I would strongly encourage you to do whatever you can. I realize it's not easy and timing is a piece of it. Um, we've had a long delay, so I would think the timing piece is getting a lot better for you. <laughs> Um, but I really would, 
it, it's, it's just such a great opportunity and we don't want to miss that. And I hope that you will work really hard to make that work in this project because I think it means a lot to the community. It's an amenity to every resident in there. Um, and uh, I also want to say on the hotel that, uh, yep, that's something new, but it's a great thing uh, in terms of, uh, of all the things that bring taxes to the city. Hotels do bring more taxes than probably most other things you could put in there. So thank you very much for that. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Shannon. Councillor Roof. <clears throat> Hotels bring taxes and not by Burlingtonians, which we really like. Um, yeah. um, my, my question is about the public improvements, the streetscape, but I just want to, I'm going to pile on with District Heat as well, I suppose. Uh, I do believe that in the existing development agreement, there's language that, that kind of dictates that the city needs to perform as well. So to a degree, it's, it's on us. And, and so while I understand that you're not given that and maybe some other reason is not able to commit tonight, I do hope that if the city does, does our part, uh, you're willing to step up and, and do yours as well with, with all the circumstances already being recognized. Um, with regard to the public improvements and the, and the street level improvements, I'd just like to uh, just give you an opportunity to, just to talk for a minute about your commitment to making sure that those improvements do, cr do come to fruition and if you can talk about how they fit into the phasing like I asked about before. Uh, you mean the, the public improvements of re Primarily the, re the reconnection of the Pine and St. Paul, but then the, the associated the improvements grids. as well? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's been an integral part of the project from kind of the beginning since we got involved, and we uh, will re reiterate our commitment to reconnecting those streets. Um, <clears throat> it goes to um, our, our also our existing TIF agreement. Um, we have, in the very near term, we've got a, uh, a meeting with your um, assistant attorney um, to start um, talking through our documentation that we need to be submitting to the state kind of very shortly as well. Um, so we, we are committed and uh, will continue to be. Thank you for reiterating that, that commitment. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councilor Roof. Um, okay, I think I'm, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. So my feeling always was, when people have asked me about this, was that the slowdown started last fall and that there was a difference between you and your partner, Don Sinex, about how to proceed, move forward. And while Mr. Sinex has receded and you've become the face of the project, he is still your partner, correct? That is correct. And he, need, he did retain rights of having to sign off on the proposal that would come before the council, is that correct? That is correct and he has now signed off and is in a full agreement on this proposal? That is correct. Thank you. Um, will the proposal now that's being put forth before us uh, service the $21.8 million TIF debt? That is something we're, we're working on as we speak, uh, and we are confident that it will. Okay, and the apartments, has the, has the price structure changed from what the original proposal was? Has the price structure changed for those apartments? Um, I, I believe we have uh, become aligned on our um, our revenue projections. Um, so that's you know, but that was part of the the the, the delay um, was where those rents need to be um, in order to sustain the project. And I th we've become aligned on that. If you said this, I missed it, so I apologize. The first proposal, the if you will, the Don Sinek's proposal, which was the 14 stories and everything else, was yeah. I think projected to be about $225 million. Can you tell us what the total cost of this project is? I, I, I can't, uh, not tonight. Okay. We're, it's something we're, we, we will talk about, but we, we, we can't talk about that tonight. Okay, can you give us some idea? Is it drastically different? Is it, I mean, don't give me an exact number, but Chelsea? <laughs> Maybe I get something out of her. <laughs> she's a, she's a vault. She'll never no, get anything no. out of her. <laughs> not, not going to the price, but also going to your previous question when you were talking about um, the price structure and everything like that. One of the reasons why we also lowered the height of the building was because we also changed the construction type. Um, our previous construction type is more expensive than what you see here today, so it's not necessarily that we had to... Um, build fewer units or, or more units to make this project work, but because we were able to change the construction type, uh, we were able to make it more economically feasible for us to build. 
Thank you. And my last question and comment is this. So, sorry. So now we have a proposal before us, and thank you for that. This is something that we've been very anxious to see in terms of um, an actual proposal, um, how we're going to move forward. I would like to hear how you're going to meet the upcoming deadlines, if possible. Maybe you can't say that tonight, but those are obviously we have some deadlines that are coming up very soon. But what I want to ask you now is I, I think there's now a burden does to me, does shift somewhat to us. We've complained, and rightfully so, that there's been a hole here. We're as frustrated, the administration has been frustrated, the public has been frustrated. Now there is a proposal. What can we do to assist to make sure that this proposal moves forward as quickly as possible? Um, like I said, it's, uh, it's regulatory. Um, the, the approval process as we, as we get into, into, the, into the actual process. Um, and we, we thank you for your, your commitment and to, to, the, to the team here, um, as well as um, finding parking solutions. And I think that's kind of a, um, a citywide initiative. Um, you guys have, have started to do your part. We're doing our part. Some of our, um, our fellow developers are, um, are, are understanding the, the need and um, so, so parking is kind of another kind of big issue that we're going to, you know, to tackle. Um, can you think of anything else? No, I think those are the two. Okay. All right, thank you. <coughs> Councilor Jang, did you have your hand back up? Yes, um, thank you, President. And I think <coughs> from what, personally what I heard today, there is still a hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. That is clear. And I, we don't know the cost of your proposal. We still don't know if there will be a new agreement, development agreement. Mm -hmm. We don't know a lot of things. We still can feel that this is maybe still, we hope that this is not another <coughs> dream. That we hope. But what I want to ask is, what is next from here today? What is next? What should we expect from you next and when should we expect it? Thank so, you, President. Okay, um, so, uh, like we said earlier, we're uh, committed to a uh, kind of an open and public process. So, before we get into um, real architecture, we'd like to get some community feedback. Um, our our architects are sitting behind us, and they're you know they're ready to start drawing. We're but meeting tomorrow. yeah, and um, but we we would like the you know public input on um, aesthetics and and programming needs and things like that as we develop the plans. Um, so that, that is kind of the next step. We're gonna start drawing and um, come and talk to you guys about it. Uh, later this year. Before Christmas. Before Christmas or after. I mean, listen, listen, there's what? There's only about nine more weeks of the year, so. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Jang. Any other counselor? Councilor Polina. How many parking spaces? Did you say that already? Are you uh, we didn't, are in this design? We didn't design? say. Um, it's uh, it, it's still we're we're still kind of working on the exact number. Um, okay. It, it, and it goes to um, tenant need um, needs of our our future residents. Um, it's kind of a it's an elaborate calculation. I just think that um, you know it's an interesting issue that following up on what Councillor Wright said. We're here now, and it's put potential that the burden's on us um, now that you've presented a proposal. And, oh. you know, our, our next step is how serious are we about transportation? Um, you know, on the one hand, we come to public forums talking about eliminating parking requirements. Um, and now we're going to have a hole in the ground for one more month, two more months, three more months, six more months because of parking. So we really need to find a way out of this and it'd be hard for me to imagine that a couple hundred parking space can keep a project like this from going forward. Thank you, Councillor Polino. Councillor Busher. Um, yes, um, I, I just want to share my perspective. I don't feel the burdens on Burlington. I feel like the Burling that the issue is that we had a project that didn't work and we're back here and we've got a proposal that looks hopeful. 
I think it's your responsibility to deliver and it's our responsibility to work with you to make sure you can deliver it. But I don't feel that the ball's in our court. I feel like you still have the ball and I just want to be really clear about that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Busher. Councillor Tracy. Councillor Paul. Thank you. Um, just wanted to follow up on what you had said, Chelsea, so that there, so that we all understand. Um, we don't live necessarily in the construction world. When you had said um, that you feel that you're able to uh, change the dimension of the build of the of the of the structure because it's a different building type, could you explain what that means? Thank you. Uh, yes, um, it's. The original proposal was a kind of a, a, admittedly a high-rise construction technique, steel and concrete, um, like you would see in any kind of major city. It's expensive, especially in, in a market like this that doesn't do it every day. There aren't the subcontractors and, and just the, the, the people that actually perform that work would, would have to be imported. Um, so in, in going to a kind of a, a steel stud, um, construction technique, it's, it's much more readily available. The, the labor is here, um, the materials are here. It's, um, it's just, um, it's more of a, a kind of a, a local market function um, that's kind of easily ex executed. Well, I am so glad to know that all of us who wanted these buildings to be shorter are saving you money. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Thanks, President Wright. Um, uh, thank, thank you to Brookfield for being here tonight and presenting tonight. Um, I, I do think tonight represented a, a step in the right direction. I'm appreciative that um, this comes after um, Brookfield has met uh, the other steps laid out in my September 27th letter. and. Uh, uh, I think it was important that, uh, that um, you've uh, started to turn the direction of the project around. Um, I agree with Councillor Busher and others who expressed the sentiment, though. I think there's a lot more work uh, to do uh, in, in the couple months ahead to get this project back on track. Um, certainly the administration will be uh, continuing to do everything we can to uh, assist you in the effort, that effort. Um, uh, I do think what you've laid out tonight represents the potential of achieving um, all of the major goals that the, the city um, laid out as we set down this process years ago. Hundreds of new homes, hundreds of jobs in the downtown, millions of dollars of additional public revenues to the city and the state, the restoration um, of uh, the streets that were lost during, during urban renewal. Um, I... Um, uh, do you think that um, uh, uh, this represents, again, a step in the right direction towards fixing a part of the downtown that has long been problematic? Uh, but uh, it, we certainly a long way to go after tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm going to just close this out by clarifying my remark. Of course the burden is on you as a developer. That's not removed we whatsoever. We, we, we understand. But I do think that we now, that there is a proposal out there that we've now heard, there's more details still to be plugged in. And I will say, I'm surprised that we can't say that, that this proposal will service the $21.8 million TIF debt. I, I'm a little surprised we can't say that now because that, it needs to be able to do that for sure. Um, can you say anything more on that before we close uh, out? I, I, th I thought we did. I, th I thought we were. We are confident that it. Okay. It, I thought you said we were. I thought you said we're working on that. Oh, no, we are me. working on it, but we are confident that the okay. uh, the revenue will cover. Okay, because that's very important. Um, but I do think that there, we are all happy today to see to see some progress, to see that there is now a plan that we can look at. There's more details to go and deadlines that are coming up, but we appreciate now seeing some forward progress. I think now that it is, uh, it is, though, on us also to assist in this process and see it move forward. So thank you very much. Um, we appreciate very much you being here tonight and giving us a full, real presentation tonight. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for, for seeing us, and, and uh, we will be back. And with that, I actually will add some applause to that.
7.07 is a public hearing regarding Burlington Comprehensive Development Ordinance ZA-19-06 Article 7 signs. Uh, should I go to, no, just open the public hearing. We'll open the public hearing on that. Anyone that would like to speak on this ordinance, please come forward. <laughs> Mr. Monkey. I don't know if you folks need a moment to clear the palette, so to speak, but um, <laughs> thanks uh, for the opportunity to speak. Earhart Monka, um, live in Ward 1, 60 Grove Street, and um, I will completely uh, resist the temptation to talk about them all, um, that not being appropriate. But I will um, say it was really gratifying, just briefly if you'll allow me, um, it was really gratifying to hear from the Burlington Wildways uh, project earlier, and thanks for the recognition, um, Councilman Busher. Um, that project actually started 30 years ago when I worked with Green Mountain Power to um, get what is known as the Salmon Hole Park dedicated to Winooski Valley Parks District. It used to simply be leased, and um, that's when we started that project, um, really. It's had a long trajectory, and it's very gratifying to see where it's at now, including the Riverwalk, and I'd be remiss in not mentioning uh, the debt that we all owe to uh, Herb Blumenthal, who... Uh, uh, Herb and I worked together for many years to um, get the Riverwalk uh, funded and, and, and going. So on the public hearing, though, I, I'm yeah, here to basically to say uh, I um, uh, hope that you pass uh, what you see before you on the inclusionary zoning. It's been a long process. Uh, it's been a thoughtful process by so many different players. And um, not to go into the details, there's so many good things to uh, say about um, what uh, went into it and the changes that have been made. And uh, all I'll say, given the time, um, is I hope you, uh, I urge you to pass it as, uh, as presented to you. So, thank you, Mr. Monkey. Thank you. Any other member of the public that would like to speak on this? Come on up, and then Kelly Devine. Hi, my name is Betsy. Um, I am speaking about this because I spent, uh, I graduated from UVM in May and I spent the entire year doing my senior thesis on inclusionary zoning in Burlington and so I spent a long time in the weeds of it um, and I was specifically looking at the spread of inclusionary zoning construction um, among census tracts and then the way those, those areas were zoned. Um, and so. I also first want to start by saying that inclusionary zoning is an incredibly limited tool. Um, it's almost frustrating how much time we spend talking about inclusionary zoning when we could be talking about like livable wages or rent control, which would be um, doing a lot more for affordable housing in Burlington. Um, so I specifically want to speak about the decreasing the payment in lieu kind of across the board, but specifically uh, making it easier to build um, affordable units off-site, so like outside of the building, in low-income neighborhoods. Um, and so it's decreasing the payment in lieu, oh, and, and making it easier to build off-site. Um, and so a part of the intent of inclusionary zoning is to be building economically integrated buildings and creating economically integrated neighborhoods. Um, and I think this is kind of sacrificing, well, I feel like the intent of these changes was to make it make more affordable units being built in areas that are higher income neighborhoods. And I think that's a good goal. Um, I think this is kind of the wrong way to go about it because by making it easier, like what these two things are doing is making it easier for developers to buy their way out of building inclusionary, zone, in zone, inclusionary zoned units in, in low income neighborhoods um, and making it easier for them to not create economic diversity in buildings. So we're gonna see more all market rate housing being built specifically in low income census tracts um, and, you know, I, I just think that that will feed into the gentrification of Burlington that we're already seeing, and that's, you know, where people get pushed out of their housing and, and out of their neighborhoods, and so by building exclusively market rate housing in low-income neighborhoods, um, the naturally affordable housing that may have been there is being, like, is now being taken over by market rate housing, um, and is not being adequately replaced, and then, um, it also creates the, the land around it more valuable. You know, if you're buying a home, you look at or how, how much the home down the street went for. So by having more market rate units in low income neighborhoods, the rest of the housing there is also gonna um, see an increase in price. And so again, I think that 
these changes have been made to increase the amount of housing, um, low income or affordable housing in wealthy neighborhoods, but I do think this is the wrong way to go about it. Um, specifically, the zoning requirements are so low in high income neighborhoods. Like we have single family neighborhoods in Burlington where you can't build more than five, like five units in a building which would start to in trigger inclusionary zoning. And those neighborhoods, those single family neighborhoods are the ones that have the most wealth anyways where we would wanna be seeing more economic diversity being built in. Um, and so again, I think if you want to do that, you would have to increase the zoning of high income neighborhoods and single family neighborhoods rather than like messing with inclusionary zoning um, and making it easier to build all market rate housing in, in low income neighborhoods. So I, I know that it's like super wonky and again I think this is frustrating that to be spending this much time on inclusionary zoning when it's so limited in the first place. Um, but I just hope that you are critical of those pieces. I can't remember exactly what lines they are in, in the law but um, they're kind of, I just think it's gonna increase the gentrification that we're already seeing in Burlington. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Kelly Devine. late, so I'll try to keep it brief. Um, thank you, President, Council President Wright. Uh, first, I want to start by thanking uh, all the folks who spent, I think it was almost two years, on this process of revising our inclusionary zoning laws, and I'm going to ask the Council to urge them to vote this forward tonight. Um, following the housing policy in Burlington closely is an important part of what I do to represent our members because we all know that uh, housing and the cost of housing affects every part of our community. So I'm really excited for all the work that the council uh, and specific committees and the administration are doing to address this problem. Um, and we know that from data that under the pre prior inclusionary zoning law, very little of any type of housing was getting built, both market rate and inclusionary. So I do think that this comes along, uh, goes a long way. I also want to thank uh, former counselors Dean and Odell for their work on this. And uh, I think it'll really help to move forward uh, the city in being able to develop a wide range of housing types, including housing that is affordable uh, if we um, advance this tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Devine. Anyone else? Mr. Monty. Long time no see. And it's uh, more fun watching you on TV, frankly. Uh, <laughs> it's a good evening to be here. Uh, Michael Monte, I'm Chief Operating and Financial Officer of uh, Champlain Housing Trust, and I, I want to come and support the ordinance. Uh, about 30 years or so ago, I think the ordinance was passed. It took a few years for that ordinance to pass, and at the time, the city of Burlington was at the cutting edge of uh, doing inclusionary zoning. It took about two or three years, I think, to get these modifications done and um and now about 900 communities around the united states do iz as a regular basis and more are, are happening and and multifamily home builders are embracing iz as a way to do development so let me just say for those of folks who think iz may be controversial in fact it's being seen as a tool to in fact ensure that communities are inclusive um, and I would say that the changes that were made were done with folks who I think who have been paying attention to the issue for a long time and working through the details of these uh, discussions. Uh, it was an open process. People were invited. Uh, I participated at least in one, uh, one of those groups, um, and it was brought forward, I think, to the committees as well as to the city council. It's been a really, really good process. I think the, the couple of changes that were made, I just want to address them real quickly here. The notion that, in fact, uh, inclusionary zoning was only being built in lower income neighborhoods principally and not in high income neighborhoods is an issue you should be taking up and I think you are moving towards that. Um, national home builder types talk about exclusionary zoning and in fact you sort of have that still in the city of Burlington where you don't allow that a density to occur. The changes that are being made here will allow for more income to come into neighborhoods where in fact you can build some affordable units and, or at least support affordable housing of different kinds and different types. We do affordable housing, we do rental, we do home ownership. There's a range of things that, in fact, can be done. This provides some flexibility to the small developers who might take a house and build three or four units and now can add a little bit of cash into a housing trust fund that can support a, a larger development, especially in some of those neighborhoods which I think need to have their zoning reviewed. So I, I would ask you to support this. I think it's a, it's a good step forward. It's a good step forward. Maybe another 30 years we'll come back, we'll take a look at it and make some of the other adjustments. But for now, 
this has been through a fairly rigged process. I do want to say one thing. This is not the only tool you should be looking at, right? This is one. Um, and in fact, it's, it is somewhat limited, but it does, it is a good one. Um, but there's more to be done in lots of other ways, and so you should be paying attention to that as well. Thank you, Mr. Monty. Anyone else who would like to speak in the public hearing on this? <clears throat> hearing none, I will close out the public hearing. Go to item number 7.08, which is the ordinance. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Chairman of the Ordinance Committee, Councilor Mason. Thank you, President Wright. I'd like to make a motion to waive the second reading, adopt the ordinance, ask for the floor back after a second. Seconded by Councilor Busher. Councilor Mason. Uh, thank you, uh, President Wright. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to invite maybe David White to come up to the, who's been shepherding this process. Um, before us tonight is a proposed amendment uh, to our ordinance as recommended by the Planning Commission after its public hearing on November 27th uh, regarding Article 7 signs. The, this proposed amendment is a comprehensive revision and modernization of the city's sign regulations. Like many communities uh, across the country, this review was undertaken in response to a Supreme Court decision in Reed versus Gilbert that uh, necessitated movement to content neutral regulation. Um, these amendments purport to accomplish that objective by creating more prescriptive and objective series of sign types that will be used to regulate the dimensions, size, location, lighting, and general design of each type. Finally, the amendment retains most of the current limitations and restrictions, such as the overall uh, sign of permitted signage and lighting, for example. And if there are content or specific questions, I would direct them to David, the expert. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mason. Before we go to the council, did you have anything you wanted to say, Mr. White? No, I'm all set. Councilor Mason summarized it perfectly. Okay. Councilor Busher. So I want to just acknowledge David White's role in this um, ordinance. It is, I think, not only is it a good ordinance for people to utilize that work in this arena, but it's also user-friendly for someone who wants to figure out what they need to do if they want to get a sign. And sometimes our ordinances, I think, are not as user-friendly. So I think this reflects a lot of work and a lot of effort on um, David White's part um, and others he can reference, but I really found it well done. I know that you will be coming back with one minor amendment because late in the game, I asked what about banners over a street and that wasn't nailed down clearly. So that will be coming back later, but this is really a very nice product and I hope anybody in this council who wants a sign will find it as user-friendly as I do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Busher. Anyone else? Are we ready to vote? Okay, all those in favor of waiving the second reading and adopting the ordinance, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Item 7.09 is another ordinance. Councilor Mason. Thank you, President Wright. I'd like to make a motion to waive the second reading, adopt the ordinance as drafted and ask for the floor back after a second. Seconded by Councilor Jane. Councilor Mason. Um, I don't envision this will be as uh, seamless as the sign ordinance. Um, so I, I want to sort of start for the public's benefit uh, to sort of go back a little history to sort of explain how we got here. Um, this is for the public's benefit. This is the inclusionary zoning um, proposal amendments. So way back in 2015, uh, the Housing Action Plan identified the need to review the inclusionary zoning standards in no? Oh, did I just miss? Oh, we're on zoning amendments. So this will be as hopefully as non-controversial. Forget what I just said. <laughs> Same motion. Um, I'll take that up after. Sorry. The proposed amendment simply brings our ordinance in compliance with our charter, which was approved by the voters in March uh, by a majority. So with that, I have nothing else to say. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Busher. Um, yes, um, this is straightforward and, and trying to be true to my original position and vote on this. I did not support splitting up planning and zoning, and this is the final step in that process, so I will not be supporting this. Thank you. It's already happened, I understand, yeah. but I still need to reflect that this is not a direction I thought was the right direction. Thank you. Councillor Jang. I apologize, I just need to know, since that was a different motion, are you still seconding that? Yes. 
Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Any further discussion on this one? <clears throat> Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That no. passes. Well, there's what's right. There's one, just one. Councilor Bush, your votes no. So it passes by 11 to 1 margin. 7.10, Councilor Mason. Now I'm right. So I would like to make a motion to waive the second reading, adopt the ordinance as presented, and ask for the floor back after a second. Second by Councilor Pine. Councilor Mason. Thank you. Now I'll give the speech I started. Um, <laughs> so for the benefit of newer councilors and the public, uh, the 2015 Housing Action Plan started this process. It identified the need or, or suggested a review of our inclusionary zoning standards. That necessitated the hiring of an expert or a consultant in 2017 who provided a report evaluating the inclusionary zoning standards and offering some initial recommendations. Following that, there was an inclusionary zoning working group uh, consisting of members of the council, planning commission, affordable and nonprofit housing developers, some of whom were here tonight, housing advocates who analyzed the consultant's report and made further recommendations to the full council regarding which of the proposals uh, should advance. That group also recommended a greater focus on inclusionary development by enabling fee and lieu and offsite compliance options based on the demographic characteristics of census tracts throughout the city. The recommendations were forwarded to the full council in 2018 who felt there still needed to be more process. So that, that the council then tasked a joint committee of uh, the ordinance and CDNR committee to review and make further recommendations on each of the working group's recommendations. That group met, held an, a series of meetings um, where it walked through each of those recommendations. That was then presented back, you know, the summary was then presented back to this full council. This council adopted the final report of the joint committee in December of 2018 and we tasked, this was a neat little trick we did, we tasked the planning commission um, with doing, you know, coming up with a relevant language. Um, that language then came back um, and is attached to this memo. That or, the, the proposed language addressed each of the joint committee recommendations. The planning commission made some further edits and recommendations to address technical amendments um, based on the housing trust manager's administration to create, and they tackled uh, something that we had been struggling with and the consultant really hadn't moved forward, which is how do you deal with off-campus institutional housing projects? Um, also to deal with development bonuses associated with proving uh, IZ units and to enable voluntary participation. The ordinance committee then took the recommendations of the planning commission uh, and worked through those over a series uh, of hearings. Couple things to call out. So I am not intending in my speech now to sort of walk through the policy, some of the policy objectives. We as a full council adopted the report and test. I appreciate not everyone may be there, but I'm not going to walk back through all of those policy um, determinations. And I respect that there are differences. You know, some of us received a communication from one constituent. I know there was some people here tonight. Um, I respect those positions, but these were policy determinations that I would say were worked through over a course of, you know, multiple years and, and countless hearings. Um, we ultimately reached that point, unfortunately, sometimes where we have to move forward, and I think we're there. So I want to talk about just two things briefly. The first is sort of the parking requirements for IZ uh, units, which became a bit of a flashpoint during uh, our hearings. Um, to be clear, the recommendation, uh, the, the initial recommendation from the working group was to eliminate any parking requirement. Um, that felt to the Joint Commission like a little, a bridge too far. Um, and so the Planning Commission came back with a different proposal, which was to reduce the parking requirements by the percentage of required inclusionary zoning. So the, the example that's given in the ordinance itself is if it's a project that has a 15% IZ requirement, the parking requirements are reduced by a commensurate 15%. And you guys can correct me if I'm saying anything incorrectly. Um, finally, just to highlight what, what went on in terms of off-campus off institutional housing. The framework that's presented in here creates a parallel standard for applying IZ requirements to off-campus institutional housing that accounts for differences in how student housing is rented, um, student housing is beds, not units, uh, how income and subsidy are assessed, uh, obviously there's no household income for students, um, and the limitations that we were facing in terms of disclosure of financial information. 
Um, the attached ordinance does require that the uh, IZ requirements apply to off-campus housing that is exclusively used by the students. In those cases, 15% of the project beds must be offered at 80% of the institution's estimated off-campus housing costs. Um, and to be eligible to lease those beds, students must have received a need-based financial aid award. On top of that, the ordinance committee worked with sort of ensuring that there was compliance. So we did, in, in this ordinance that's proposed, um, we built in a rec uh, you know, an annual reporting requirement as well as audit rights um, in fa you know, through the housing trust manager. The last issue, just to briefly touch on, uh, it late in the process, there was, I think it was sort of punted multiple times because it was too complicated, quite honestly, to deal with, is the concept of smoothing. Um, there had been concerns that, you know, our AMI had, you know, there are some anomalies in AMI, and what became apparent is that really was in part attributable to the, the, the size of the sampling and, you know, who you happen to talk to um, on that given day. So that our committee, uh, with former Councillor Nodell's help, tried to come up with some concept to work smoothing into the process. We did... Um, reach out through the planning, uh, the planning staff to the developers and others that were involved in the IZ working group. Um, and in summary, I think the, the, the conclusion we ultimately came on was, you know, maintaining the current system, that adopting a smoothing uh, mechanism was, was quite complicated, potentially created reporting uh, requirements for, you know, various nonprofit developers, um, and also made it uh, unnecessarily complicated. And the other piece, I think, that that came through pretty clear was um, if adopted, it potentially would impact the borrowing capacity of these projects, which would further limit the number of units that were available. So the ordinance committee did not adopt a smoothing, um, any smoothing policy as presented. So with that, I know we have a very uh, large group that has been um, of great assistance throughout this entire process, and I would defer to them if there are questions from the council. Thank you. Before I turn it over to the council, any remarks anyone wants to make to set it up or go to the questions? I, I think Councillor Mason summarized uh, the process and the ordinance very well, um, as I think is very clear. Uh, it has been a long and a very detailed process. Um, it's a very complex ordinance. It has a lot of moving parts. Um, we've got staff from uh, city planning, CEDO, and permitting and inspections here to to try to answer questions as well as uh, Councillor Pine has was, uh, been involved in this conversation for uh, quite some time and I think Michael Monty hasn't left the house yet so um, he's a wealth of information. Thank you. Megan, you seem to be pulling the microphone forward. Did you have anything to add? No, I was just going to say that as usual, Councillor Mason did an excellent job summarizing. We can all agree with that. Okay, Councillor Busher, and then Councillor Pine, and then Councillor Hanson. Um, so, first of all, I want to thank the people that I'm looking at because, and the people in the audience, because they were, and obviously other councillors who took part in this process, because they were invaluable. Um, you know, I got involved as part of the joint committee and then followed it. Um, through the Planning Commission and learned a lot. And I think that the Planning Commission really did a wonderful job with, with trying to address the off-campus housing and trying to link not only the fact that we put an inclu inclusionary zoning component, but we had that, but it wasn't linked to the right population of people. It was just linked there, just hung there. And so I want to really commend all of you for getting the institutions to come work with you and to come forward with a, with a proposal that I think is, is good. Um, and so um, I, I really wanted to speak to that. The other thing I wanted to say was that um, this is chock full of information and I had to look to the experts. It's not, this is not, I'm not an expert. Others on the council may be, but I'm not. Um, I, and I think that what I've learned though and what I knew from the get-go was inclusionary zoning is not, it is a way to make, to, just as it states, it's a way to integrate um, mixed income people in one housing project. It's not, a, it's not 
a catalyst to create affordable housing. It accomplishes that and it integrates it, but there, there have to be other ways to really get affordable housing built. So I think that for those people who look at this and say they feel let down by this process, it's because the process has a a primary purpose, and that primary purpose is not to fill our affordable housing need. It is one part of that process, but it's not the only part of that process. So I respect the comments made tonight um, during the public forum part of this, um, but I really feel that this is an improvement on what we had. Um, Councillor Mason came up with a part of it, which was we were having people not build um, uh, affordable units because they couldn't afford to deal with the um, fees that are being proposed in, uh, where is this? This is such a lengthy ordinance, but payment in lieu option. Um, some of these were deterrents, and so now we, um, he came up with this tiered recommendation, and now we believe that this will allow some of these smaller projects to move forward. So I think that there are lots of things in here that are good. The other piece I just wanted to speak to was the fact that, um, you know, we talked about inclusionary zoning. You can have off-site off options if indeed the the area is 51% or greater lower moderate income. And I think that the fear is that this will then create an area that has higher income. Well, if that's the case, then it won't, they, you won't have the offsite option. Um, so I think that there are checks and balances with this ordinance, and I'm, hope, I'm hoping that that will come to be realized. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Busher. Councillor Pine. Thank you. The, um, yeah, the, the history of this ordinance goes back quite a ways. Um, and it was a compromise to get the ordinance that we have, um, not just the one you have before you tonight, but the ordinance from 1990, which took five years to pass. So um, if it took a while to amend it, it took a lot longer to come to agreement on that. Um, I think the key thing that Councillor Busher just mentioned, which I just want to reiterate, is that don't look at inclusionary zoning as a production tool. And if you do, you're looking at the wrong tool. So if you keep it in your mind that it's an inclusion tool, and if it's inclusive, it, if it achieves its objectives, we have neighborhoods and we have developments that are more economically inclusive. If we have small developments that don't ever happen because the ordinance has a chilling effect, on smaller developments, you're getting zero, so 15 or 20 or 25 percent of zero, in my math, still equals zero. So it's really important to remember that small projects that are not feasible with today's requirements become more feasible and they generate revenue that goes into the housing trust fund. So I think it's really critical that we think about that and we be realistic about what's feasible and what isn't feasible. We heard from the for-profit developers what was and wasn't feasible, but we had non-profit developers, and um, John Davis was with us, who's one of the nation's foremost advocates on this issue, looking at their numbers to determine if what they said was actually legit or if it just was a type of belly aching that you might hear from certain segments of the economy. But, um, so I just want to say that the, the changes that are proposed tonight really do acknowledge that smaller developments had a very difficult time taking those costs that are real costs, it's a drag on the, on the cash flow of a project if your rents are that much below what you could normally charge, that if you amortize that over time, you've got a significant deterrent to doing smaller developments. So that was really important. The current payment in lieu is over $150,000 for each inclusionary unit you would have to pay, who you'd have to create. That is ultimate, that's a de facto prohibition against a payment in lieu. So that's our current policy that's on the books before we adopt this change. That just means we have a, a theoretical provision that allows for payment in lieu, but it's actually, in reality, no one can actually afford to do that. That would drive the prices of all the other units through the roof. It would make things incredibly uh, economically not feasible. So um, 
we arrived at these tiered amounts through a pretty diligent process that involved looking at data, crunching numbers, looking at performance, having Champlain Housing Trust and Housing Vermont tell us if the numbers we were getting from the private developers made sense. And basically the committee was in a process of continual education and really trying to understand what this meant in reality. So um, many of us might have felt better saying, let's keep the dollar amount really high, let's keep the percentages really high, um, you know, let's really s make sure we get everything we want but if you're getting everything you want and you get nothing, you're still getting zero. So I think just keep in mind, we've got to try and move the needle here, and that's what we tried to do. Thank you, Councillor Pine. I think that crystallized that point very well. Councillor Hansen. Thanks so much, and yeah, thanks to all who, who worked so hard on this process um, and, and got us to where we are. Um, I do have a, a specific question and, and concern and want to discuss further. Um, it's. Uh, around the waiver of fees, so I'm looking at lines 26 through 29, um, and specifically the 25% the waiver of fees um, for qualifying units in a project that initially sells for a price that is affordable for households below 90% of AMI or that initially rents for a three period, or for a three year period for a price that is affordable for households below 75% of AMI. That's the language. Um, and I'm wondering, is there anything in, in place that would prevent um, these units from, you know, after the three-year period, the, the rents being jacked up substantially or for the units that are selling being resold at a substantially higher price um, a year, two, three years um, down the line? So I, I can speak to part of that and perhaps uh, others at the table as well. The section that you're referring to um, is a waiver of the impact fee. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the amount of the impact fee that's assessed on on affordable housing units, um, most of the units that uh, are covered under the inclusionary zoning um, have a um, affordability, uh, long-term affordability requirement of 99 years. Is there anything you want to add to that? Um, as the CETO staff person who's responsible for uh, making a recommendation about impact fee waivers, um, it's extremely rare for me to see projects um, that take advantage of this. Typically, all the inclusionary units that we, um, that we write waivers for fall into uh, the fifty percent or one hundred percent category. And, and that being said, so what is the? Can I just hear more about the rationale be, behind that twenty-five percent um, inclusion? Not inclusion. It's a way. I know why it's there. So I would just point out that these three provisions, items one, two, and three, the 25, 50, and 100 percent. Got to pull the microphone a little closer. Sorry. Is that close enough? There you go. Yes. Um, so these pertain to um, affordable units above and beyond uh, meeting the minimum requirement. So your typical project has 15, 20, 25 percent required inclusionary. And beyond that, if you have an additional uh, number of dwelling units, that would qualify for a 25% waiver of fee. They could do it. Um, Todd said it's pretty rare. I, I can't think of a single case where someone has done that above and beyond the minimum. It's possible. Um, is there anything that precludes the prices going up after that three-year period? No. And the to address the rationale perspective, um, it's really uh, concern that the IZ working group and the subsequent bodies that have reviewed this have considered in terms of creating balance between what's required of the ordinance and what the offsets are that a developer receives from that ordinance. Um, the issue specifically with looking at fees is just to help balance some of the costs involved with actually executing an inclusionary zoning project and to provide a, a minimal amount of relief from those costs. Thank you. Um, so yeah, all, all of that being said, I, uh, the fact that it's, it's not regularly or practically never used, but also 
the concern about you know the prices then being increased i don't in my mind this isn't necessary and I, I don't think it serves a strong purpose to give this fee waiver so i would just like to um propose to simply strike lines 26 through 29 um from the resolution Councilor Hansen is proposing to strike lines to amend by striking lines 26 through 29. Is there a second to that? Seconded by Councilor Freeman. I will put out an email in the future asking councilors to try to do amendments before we're on the floor again, but nonetheless, it is on the floor. Count, uh, City Attorney Blackwood. Yeah, this is a an ordinance and it's a zoning ordinance, and so the. When you want to make an amendment to a zoning ordinance, what it will mean if you want to make this amendment is that you have to rewarn the public hearing um, and and uh, come back right. and vote on the ordinance another evening because uh, it's our belief that this is a substantive change to the ordinance. Okay, so the, so the amendment can be acted on, but it what it's it means we have to restart the. You have to go back, back. and warn a new public hearing. Yes. Okay. Councilor Pine. Let me just ask for clarification on that point. Would it also require going back to the Planning Commission? City Attorney Blackwood. The way that the the state statute reads is that you warn you have to warn the public hearing. It, you have to have at least 14 days notice and at least 10 days before the hearing. You have to send it back to the Planning Commission, but that you don't have to necessarily wait for any action by them. It's just a notice more than anything, an opportunity for them to come to the public hearing and. Yeah. State their but, position. yeah, I could try, Mr. President, if I could. The 25% waiver, just to be clear, is, is simply there in the event, and this happened, I did this for 18 years, I think it might have happened once or twice, where a private developer comes in and their market rate units meet this requirement and then their inclusionary units fall below that. So this is extremely rare. This was... I can remember it was Dennis Rule on Manhattan Drive. I mean, it was that specific who got this waiver. And it is really recognition that the initial rents or sale prices being this affordable is extremely hard for market developers to do. So it's just intended to be a little reward for that. That's all this is here for. Thank you, Councillor Pine, for that clarification. Appreciate that. Any discussion on the amendment? Yeah, am, am I? Well, well, hold a minute. I, uh, Councilor Paulino, do you have your hand raised to be recognized? Yes. Councilor sorry. Paulino. Uh, I think you mentioned, uh, Ms. Tuttle, that this is never, well, it was, I think it was you that said that, um, sorry, could I get your name again, Scott? Um, that it's never been taken advantage of or that it's extremely rare to actually go beyond um, the minimum requirement? Uh, I wouldn't say going beyond the minimum requirement generally. I'd say specifically this provision, um, agreeing with what Councillor Pine has just said. R right, but I think, I guess my point was since Councillor Pine's left, there still hasn't been some like huge uptick. No, no, it hasn't been used at all since he left. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Polino. <coughs> Any other further discussion? All right, let's vote on the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hands. Those opposed, that amendment is defeated by a vote of 11 to 3. The three no votes, three no votes are councillors. Three yes votes. Three yes votes, you're right, excuse me. Three yes votes are Councillor Freeman, Councillor Hansen, and Councillor Tracy. Got that, clerk's office? Okay, we're back to the ordinance. Any further discussion on the ordinance? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? I'll try one more time. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Just wanted to make sure. It was very, very low. Uh, item 7.11, Councilor Mason. Uh, thank you, President Wright. I can make a motion to waive the second reading and adopt the ordinance and ask for the floor back very briefly for a second. Moved and seconded by Councilor Busher. Councilor Mason has the floor back. Thank you, President Wright. So this is the sister to the one we just adopt, adopted. This relates to illuminated signs, and I would also note uh, that Mr. White is here to answer any questions. Director White, anything to say before we go to the Council for discussion or questions? Simply that this, this is not zoning, but this is part of the other uh, 
portion of the city code of ordinances that um, is being eliminated because it's redundant to what is uh, required by the zoning ordinance as well as by the building code. Um, and that particularly uh, matters related to uh, electrical service and, and construction. Thank you, Director White. Now open it up to the council. Any questions from the council? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Apparently passes unanimously. Uh, that brings us, after concluding all those items, thanks to the good work of the Ordinance Committee, Councillor Mason and the other members of the Ordinance Committee. 7.12, resolution by Councillor Busher. Councillor Busher. Um, yes, I move to waive the reading and adopt the resolution, and after a second, I'd like the floor back briefly. Seconded by Councillor Hanson. Councillor Busher, you have the floor back. Thank you. Um, so Chris Burns is here tonight and um, to, in case there are questions um, for um, BED, but um, as the resolution states, after we had the um, resolution on climate crisis, you know, I, I tried to figure out what to do, what, what we could do collectively, and um, I met with um, a developer, I met with Eric Farrell and talked about um, new construction. I also talked to Darren Springer about new construction and significant rehabilitation and um, realized I got educated, um, as I always do, that, sig that significant rehabilitation of uh, units or structures is a whole different ball game. So um, I focused then on um, electrification of heat and air conditioning in new construction only as the first step. Um, I think the resolution speaks for itself. Um, most of the details were um, hammered out by BED and um, our permitting and inspection services department. Um, to put in what was possible and to set a timeline for us to have um, proposed changes to our uh, permitting and building code ordinances by the beginning of 2020. So um, that's where I'll stop. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Councillor Busher. Discussion by the council? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously, Councillor Busher. Thank, Thank you. you. And we will now move on to item number eight, committee reports. Any committee chair who would like to speak on committee activity? <laughs> Councillor Tracy. So we uh, had a Transportation Energy Utilities Committee meeting um, this past uh, Thursday, and we discussed a number of topics. Um, the first of which was the narrow streets uh, policy. If folks don't remember, we had discussed in previous years uh, streets that are very narrow and become even more so during the winter time, uh, which hinders emergency vehicle access. Um, so they started last year with uh, some of the most narrow streets, uh, specifically Germain Street, um, and trying to address some of the, the concerns that fire had raised around that. They're continuing that conversation with both, uh, with, um, uh, Charles and Russell streets and they're going to be actually having a meeting on Wednesday I believe at 6 or 6 30 um, to continue that conversation uh, around um, those particular streets um, it becomes really an issue of as I said before access and figuring out how we do that uh, at least on a seasonal basis um, so they're having that conversation with neighbors on that we did also discuss um, uh, Green Mountain we did also have Green Mountain Transit come to us uh, and share um, some information about um, how the new system uh, next gen uh, has rolled out uh, unfortunately we're seeing um, a decline in ridership with ridership down about four percent um, right now um, which is certainly troubling um, they said that the colors system has been sort of challenging to follow so in order to uh, address some of that there's some there's a definite intention to 
add back some of the numbers in addition to the colors so that folks have that point of reference that they may have been used to, so giving that uh, as, a, as, a, as a piece. There was also blue line scheduling was, a, was an issue that they're trying to address. Um, and then they feel like they need to, they've rolled out the app that gives you real-time tracking. They're working on that as well as the, they've changed the contractor at the, the downtown transit center with regards to the displays. You might have noticed that it's time displays. It doesn't tell you where the bus actually is. They're working on fixing that too. So ridership is down, um, but there are other issues that are, that are at play there. Um, they did also talk a little bit about, uh, they also did address um, the fare free um, aspect um, of it. And they said that, um, that uh, they're open to considering additional fare-free routes. Um, it's just a matter of the communities having to pay for those routes. And for instance, they said that um, you know a city loop might be an option um, in the two hundred thousand dollar range. So it's it's a significant cost and something we would have to think of. But um, that there are, is a willingness, at least if communities are willing to shoulder that that additional cost, to consider thinking about that and looking at that. So um, that's something that I think that there is you know at, at least on my part. Can, continued interest in exploring. Um, we also heard from um, the, about the street seats and, uh, and parklets program uh, update, which um, if you don't remember was in front of the, uh, in front of different areas uh, in, this, in, in the city. And um, we heard from Will Clavel about that. It got pretty, pretty strong uh, feedback and in favor of that project and continuing it. Uh, in future years um, from those who did respond to the survey. Um, the question is, you know, how do we, what does that look like in future years and any feedback? I know that uh, Will would be certainly welcoming of any feedback that counselors have, so be sure to, to share that with him. Um, we heard briefly about the, the Amtrak's storage and servicing, though the, the, the council's, uh, the, the, the question around Amtrak was really with regards to um, uh, a continued desire. There's a lot of complex issues to hear about that at a, at a future council meeting, and uh, Director Spencer did state that he would like to, to see us address that at a future council meeting. So, um, and then finally, the last thing I would like to address is the um, water resources rate study update. We had a big conversation about that um, at, at the council level, and um, I just want to draw folks' attention to the fact that there will be a meeting here uh, on the rate study. Uh, issue um, that's going to be coming up um, tomorrow night uh, at six, I believe. So, if folks are interested in water rates, please come join us. Join us for that conversation. So, sorry for the long update. We had a lot of important topics that um, I know the council has been deeply involved in. Thank you, Councillor Tracy. Councillor Pine, real quick, um, the Community Development Neighborhood Revitalization Committee. We have a tentative meeting that we just set up sitting here tonight, just so you know. So there's some multitasking. But the purpose is to discuss with the uh, Brookfield folks how to include the community in community engagement going forward, the issues that we discussed tonight in response to the resolution that Councillor Freeman put forward back in, I think, uh, August. So we'll be getting to that, and we'll report back to the council, and uh, that's it. Thank you, Councillor Pine. I'm going to recognize Councillor Mason for a motion. I'd just like to make a motion to suspend the rules to complete our agenda. Councillor Mason has moved. We suspend the rules to complete the agenda. That motion is seconded by Councillor Hansen. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none. I'll I just want to note that our shirts expire at 1030. The shirts, <laughs> by the way, yes, don't, uh, before I forget to say it, everybody give me your shirts back, please. What? You, you just want the shirts off our back, that's all? What's that? You just want the shirts off our back? That's all I want, the shirts off your back. That's not asking for that much. So yes, uh, everybody, I am bringing them back where they belong when we leave here. Um, so all those in favor of the motion to suspend rules, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Rules are suspended. We'll complete the agenda. Councilor Shannon. Uh, thank you. The PAC... A committee met and uh, we there are three main things we discussed um, one is the mural which has had the plaque replaced now in both French and English um, as well as uh, it has been repaired and remounted and uh, some of you may have seen that um, the memorial auditorium at our last, our last meeting was the day that the RFP went out for Memorial Auditorium. Those bids are due back on December 2nd, 
and we're going to meet again to take a look at how productive that was. We were told that there were no national bidders um, in that. Uh, there was a requirement that uh, any, any bidders actually go on October 17th to, for a tour of the building. Um, I think there were, uh, I think there were only two, two bidders that, that took advantage of that, though there might be somebody else that um, can make a special appointment to do it. Uh, and as a reminder to the council, um, the plan for that is that uh, if we have a successful proposal, we would go to the voters for approval of a $15 million GO bond. And um, we still have a lot of other money that we would need to provide to move this forward to uh, save Memorial Auditorium. So there's a lot of ifs with that. And the vote would be in November of 2020. Um, also, we, uh, we supported an, a new off-leash dog ordinance that I expect to be coming to the council. I'm not sure if it'll make it onto our next agenda, but if not, um, it would be the one following that, which would be sent to our ordinance, ordinance committee for further review. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Shannon. Any other chair to update us on committee activity? Just checking to see if anyone else first. Okay, we're all set. Uh, we'll go to you after your council. Sorry, Councilor just, Mason, you are also chair of charter change. Councilor Tracy. Councilor Tracy, that's what I said. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I just want to let folks know that, that um, we had a couple of charter change, potential charter changes referred to us uh, that we are going to be taking up. Um, those being um, the, um, we had the, the, the non-citizen voting rights and then the, the housing trust fund issue. Um, put forward to us as, as a committee and we'll be uh, starting to meet on those issues on Tuesday, uh, November 5th at 5 p.m. We have, are still figuring out a meeting location, but just want to let the council know about that and I'll remind you again next week. All right. Thank you, Councilor Mason. Councilor Tracy. Councilor Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Jane. I don't know why. Thank you, President. Um, so the HR committee will be meeting on Tuesday, um, the 5th, and it will be 5.30 at 200 Church Street, and we will be reviewing some policies related to HR in general about the city, and also get some update about the diversity, equity, and inclusion director position, how many people have applied, and things along those lines. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Jang. Um, with that, we will conclude that item, and item number nine is city councilors on general city affairs. Any councilor on general city affairs? Councilor Hanson. Thanks. Uh, two things briefly. One is this coming Sunday, there's going to be a tenant summit um, from 12.30 to 4.30 at Fletcher Free Library. I'm excited to attend and hope to see others there as well. Um, the other is I just wanted to uh, report back that um, Councillors Shannon, Councillor Tracy, and myself, and many other city staff had the amazing opportunity to um, go to um, Montreal on Friday and um, get the opportunity to see their, their bicycle infrastructure, um, much of which has been implemented over the past you know, five to 10 years. Um, they have moved very boldly and aggressively forward on adding protected bicycle lanes um, and you know, removing parking, removing travel lanes, and really in, in improving active transportation infrastructure. And it's, it's made a huge impact, and I hope that we can uh, learn, learn some lessons from, from what Montreal has done and, and move forward here in the same way. Thank you, Councillor Hanson. Councillor, who was next? Councillor Tracy. Councillor Tracy. So I just want to echo Councillor Hanson's words about the, the trip up to Montreal. It was absolutely phenomenal to get, to get a chance to go around with a city councillor to hear directly from their public works and to understand not specifically how they're managing such a system in winter. That's oftentimes a concern that's, that people bring forward. Uh, and it was amazing to not only be there with other councillors, um, but also a variety of different members of city staff uh, from 
um, people who drive the plow trucks uh, to run our snow fighting operation so that they could actually interact with the same folks uh, or counterparts on the Montreal side of things, um, which is particularly helpful. And one of the big takeaways is that if you build it and plow it um, and are willing to adjust over time, you don't get it perfect right away, but if you're willing to adjust over time, you can really see some increase, some dramatic increases in ridership. I think they said they saw an over 150% uh, increase in winter ridership over a three-year period in Montreal. So um, pretty substantial and exciting things. And I think that this is all geared towards safety. I heard just from a constituent today who was really concerned about people blowing through stop signs uh, and a concern about that. So we continue to hear this on people's minds. And I think that when we start to embrace these solutions, uh, we're able to, to create a traffic calming effect um, that really helps to make people feel safe on the streets. Thank you, Councillor Tracy. Councillor Paul. Thank you. Um, so one of the items that's in our budget, one of the many line items in our budget is a, uh, um, uh, a uh, it's in the regional programs for the Vermont International Film Festival. Um, it is definitely money well spent. Um, I, uh, I went on Sunday to see one of the, one of the films. Um, it was called uh, uh, The Report on uh, Sarah and Salim. And um, there were maybe two or three empty seats in the theater. Um, other than that, it was completely filled. And um, I spoke with one person who said they have been to, they had been to 15 films over the nine days of the film festival. Thought that was quite a few until I spoke with a couple who had been to 25. So they have a tremendously loyal following. And whether you've been to 25 or 15 or you've been to one, it is definitely uh, money well spent. And. Uh, um, I'll be looking forward to next year's. If you haven't gone, uh, try to keep that in mind for next next fall. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Paul. Councillor Roof. Uh, very quickly, I did get a call from our good friend uh, Jared Wood uh, today, and, and actually a call last week from him as well. And he did ask me to bring up that he, uh, someone who walks a lot, a pedestrian, uh, mostly in Ward One, but he gets outside of Ward One once in a while. He is. Continue to see, he's continuing to see uh, people rolling through stop signs and is still concerned about pedestrian safety. And so I just wanted to highlight that to the council on, with his request uh, and say that I think we do need to be pursuing a, a mix of kind of built infrastructure solutions as well as enforcement to make sure that we're keeping our pedestrians safe. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Roof. Councillor Pine. Just uh, dovetailing with what Councillor Roof just said, the um, concept that I asked the chief about, and I'd like to get council sense at some point is is basically stoplight mounted cameras that that shoot cars that shoot through red lights that's just an idea that other cities have used i know it's controversial but it's extremely effective without putting a huge burden on our police force so think about it let's talk about it another time thank you councillor pine councillor jang <laughs> yep um this is just an announcement especially for people who live in the new north end you probably don't know that every third Wednesday at our NPA, we start with a great, wonderful dinner. It's a free dinner, and every single person is welcome. The past two dinners that we have, over 75 people attended. 75 people. So there are people, great people like there, such as Karina, Keenan Christiansen, Carmen George, and so many people building communities out there. So, councillors, if you have the time, next Wednesday, please show up. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jang. Anyone else? Hearing none, um, I'm going to pass. There is no City Council President update. Mr. Mayor, take us home. Thanks, President Wright. Um, it uh, you know, has been three weeks since the last time we met, so a number of things happened uh, that I did just want to note uh, briefly. Um, first of all, St. Paul Street is fully open for um, anyone who hasn't taken um, uh, that walk uh, recently, the uh, and, and I'm happy to say the complaints, concerns about the design have largely uh, have basically stopped. Um, positive reactions have been flowing in in recent weeks. There will be a celebration of sorts uh, uh, to kind of mark the opening of these streets and, and the first great streets effort. It probably is not going to happen until the spring when the final final piece, which is a public art installation, will also be done. Um, but in the meantime, I do. Particularly encourage people to check it out when it's raining down there. The, uh, it's worth going and seeing how the, the storm gardens um, that 
are the real innovation with those streets actually work in the rain. Um, it's, 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 it's interesting to see in action and, and satisfying. Um, I want to congratulate our, our colleague, Council Roof, on a successful innovation week within his uh, new role as uh, head of BTV Ignite. And um, heard lots of positive feedback about the week this year. Um, uh, the, at the last time we did meet, the council um, <coughs> supported the lengthy housing resolution coming out of the housing summit work and did want to let the council know for those of you not on the committee, the committee has already met two times uh, since that passage, another meeting happening this week. There's a lot of work to be done coming out of that resolution, but the, the joint committee between the ordinance committee and the planning commission have, has uh, uh, jumped right in and is working on the details. So that, that work continues. Related to that work, um, I, Council should look for the memo I've mentioned before. The CEDO team has been exploring, um, also coming out of the housing summits, uh, the question of whether Burlington should be doing more with respect to tenant protections. And you should have that memo um, uh, shortly, uh, as was committed previously, that it would be out by the end of the month. Um, finally, I did just want to give people a heads up, the council, councilors a heads up, that. Uh, uh, President Wright and I have talked, and we are anticipating an executive session on uh, before, before next week's meeting on the real issues, which obviously you're hearing in public forum uh, are coming towards us. Some decisions are coming towards us. Uh, we should be uh, ready to talk about the uh, possible negotiations um, uh, with the council um, uh, next week, and we're looking forward to that. So uh, details about that to come. With that, President Wright, that's all I got tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Motion to adjourn, moved by Council Roof, seconded by Council Hansen. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, we are adjourned.